Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, June 2nd meeting of the Finance Committee. As you can see, we are once again meeting virtually in light of the pandemic. So to begin the meeting, I'll read the standard statement. Pursuant to the governor's order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A paragraph 20, as well as the select board's emergency order dated March 16th, 2020, the Finance Committee will be using remote participation for this meeting. The audio of this meeting is being recorded and will be posted to the town's webpage within 24 hours in accordance with the governor's emergency action requirement of keeping the public informed of actions during this meeting. I would ask that all participants remotely attending this meeting, please state your name for identification purposes each time you speak throughout the meeting. At this time, I will take a roll call of the membership. Mr. Sparrow. Present. Ms. Zemer. Here. Mr. Alfred. Present. Mr. Maxwell. Here. Ms. Narcessian. Here. And Mr. Murphy. Here. Yes, and of course I'm here. So uh, the meeting is now called to order. Okay, uh, let's begin. Uh, we have the minutes. Uh, I just want to give a, before we get to the minutes, I just want to give you a very quick update. Uh, I did talk to Sharon earlier today, just before this meeting, and we're looking, you know, I told you we're, we have some transfers and so forth. Uh, we're trying to do kind of a bulk transfer of the paperwork so that we don't have to go back to town hall all the time. So the plan right now is that I'm going to get all the paperwork from her in two weeks on the 15th for all the end of year transfers we need to do. So we'll plan on taking all those up at the meeting on the 15th. Okay. Um, okay, minutes, Mr. Murphy. I just sent two sets of minutes that I incorporated both yours and Sue's edits into to the rest of the committee like 15 minutes before the meeting. Um, there were a lot of stuff, all the edits, so I didn't get through all of them. So we have the 31st of March and the April 28th. If we want to quickly review them or do you want to hold off and no, I, I'd like to we should we should approve them if they're ready to be reviewed. Yeah. Nobody else sent anything, so I'm assuming everybody else is okay with it. Can well, I, so let me ask you one ask you one quick question, which is um, did you find conflicting changes between what Sue what, sent and I sent? No, I mean, it was pretty much just ticky tacky wording and adding words okay. here and there. I just so. want to make sure that because I mean, I know what I changed, so I'm like, I'm fine yeah. with if it didn't change substantively from that, then I'm fine with it. No, Sue wanted to delete some things, but I didn't delete them just because I think, I mean, it's all public, so it's there. This is what it was, the minutes were taken and it was there, so. Okay, uh, Mr. Sparrow? Um, the only thing I would like to change it's a small thing but just in the in the uh, march 31st minutes yep in the third paragraph um i just like to strike out that dollar amount in the third line just like most likely be higher that's all oh, that's true yeah we could i'd just like to have that room otherwise i i'm fine okay thank you Okay, anybody else have any other comments on March? We'll consider March 31 first. So any other comments on that one? Okay, and uh, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes of March 31st as amended. Motion to approve the minutes of March 31st as amended. Second. Okay, any further discussion on that? So we'll proceed to vote, Mr. Sparrow? Yes. Ms. Zemer? Yes. Mr. Alfred? Yep. Mr. Maxwell? Yes. Ms. Recession? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. And I vote yes, so we're good. Good. Make sure I got to got check all the windows, make sure I got everybody. Okay, so that's approved. So let's move on to, uh, what was it, uh, April 28th? Yes. Okay. And again, same same question, Ben, which is from my changes, there weren't no. major changes? Okay. No. Nope. So anybody else? Great, it was just sent 15 minutes ago, so I apologize, but Ken sent me his, and I actually had to work today, so he sent it to me this morning. Oh, so oh, you're pinning this one on me, huh? I, you know, I have to throw somebody on the bus. I'm not taking ownership. Okay, that, that's fine, that's fine. I'll, I'll take one for the team here. So, Okay, if everybody takes a minute to read it, and if they're good with it, uh, whenever everybody's ready, go ahead and make a motion.
see everybody looking down. I know. What's the date of this meeting? April what? 28th. April 28th. I, make a, I make a motion to approve the minutes from April 28th. Second. Second. Okay, any further discussion on that motion? Okay, let's proceed to a vote. Uh, Mr. Sparrow? Yes. Ms. Ms. Zemer? Yes. Mr. Alfred? Absolutely. Mr. Maxwell? Yes. No, you're smiling, Dan. Uh, Ms. Nersessian? Yes. Uh, Mr. Murphy? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay, those minutes are approved. Okay, now we do have the whole bunch of other ones uh, that you were sent out. I presume that we'll have those edited by next week now that you have all the feedback? Yeah, well, I will have feedback from two people. If somebody else wants to send feedback, please do so. Read them. Um, and I'll incorporate everything, and I'll send it out before the next meeting, before 15 minutes before, so at least a day before. Okay. Okay, so we have one quick item before we get to the school uh, issue, because I know a lot of people are on ICN, Louise, and everybody else here finally. Um, is Mr. Keast and the line item transfer. So we had the back and forth. Is there an update? Do we have any update on that, Mr. Keast, with regards to uh, the, the dude contract? Yeah, I had uh, sent um, the end of last week uh, a copy of the revised contract. It also included some T's and C's. I sent it to the FinCom email address. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the, uh, the contract addressed some of the questions that uh, Ms. Nasarian and I spoke about. Uh, and uh, it's there for review. I think the, some of the key points were sort of the uh, indemnification of the third party uh, uh, provider that's gonna be doing a lot of the you know, inspections at the buildings. Uh, so we did get that uh, in the contract. Um, we also have clarification on the types of, of folks that uh, are going to be, in terms of credentials, that are going to be doing this inspection work, uh, as well as uh, some more detail on the, uh, um, on the scope of what they're going to be covering. And that's you know, outlined in that contract. So have you looked at it, Sue? No, I, I haven't had a chance to just given my work schedule this past week. Um, James, just one thing. Did we, were you able to flip around the, um, the payment schedule? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. That, that's not a problem. Okay. So does anybody else have anything? Cause, cause what I would say at this point is I think, you know, James has certainly given us all the information we need for this. Um, what I would suggest is, you know, if anybody has any issues where we, we can't vote on it tonight anyway because I don't have the paperwork. It's in the mailbox with the pile of other stuff. So, so we're going to get to it, James. As I told you, right? It's just a matter of me going over there and getting it. When at this point it looks like the fifteenth. Are you okay with us approving it on the fifteenth? That's fine. That's fine. I just uh, I don't want to pass the fifteenth and get to a point where uh, you no. Know. We'll, we'll get it in FY twenty. I know what you're trying to do, but the thing is that what happens is we get a bunch of these end of year transfers. So typically, what we do is we wait till they pile up and then we just do a. I get all the paperwork, even when we're not in a pandemic, we typically get it all in one day and then just sit and do one meeting where we go through every single transfer and, and try to wrap up the fiscal year. So I, as I said, I talked to Sharon earlier and we're going to try to do that on the 15th this year. So if you're okay with the 15th, then I'll just get that with that whole batch of paperwork and we'll, we'll get through then. Absolutely. Not a problem. Okay. So if, if there are no questions for Mr. Keith, then I guess you're set. You don't have to hang out unless you really have nothing better to do on a Tuesday night. <laughs> I'll eat my dinner and watch. How about that? That's right. That's, hey, whatever you want to do. If this is a public meeting. You're, you're, feel free to stay if you want to. Um, okay. So next up is the school committee. And we I see we have representation from the uh, superintendent and also from the budget subcommittee and the business manager. Um, so... Uh, uh, I guess, uh, Ann Louise, are you going to be talking on behalf of the, uh, just, so Sorry. go ahead, you have to mute myself. Um, sure, I'll start, and then I think we may just, you know, need as a group to have a little bit of an open conversation so that we can figure out the best way to proceed. Um, and I have on the meeting, um, Dan McLeod is there. I see Dan, you zoomed in. And do we have Keith Boudet in addition to yeah, Dr. Yeah, he's, he's here. He's here. He's okay. I'm sorry. I'm, you're not tiled out. Probably should do that. Um, yeah, let me try that. So um, 
The last several weeks, the school committee has been working very hard with um, the liaisons from the finance committee sitting at the table, along with our representative from the select board, um, which is Tina Hine, to um, to really assess the scope and scale of our financial needs heading into um, FY21. And that's on top of, you know, trying to finalize where we actually stand for the for this year. Um, the two most significant uh, areas of concern with related to related to next year's budget are um, under the sort of domain of PPE, um, equipment, sanitizing materials, et cetera, that we might need um, to open schools next year, in addition to um, additional technology requirements to put a more robust um, plan in place to support either remote learning or some sort of hybrid scenario. The details of those two scenarios are yet to be determined at a fine level where you know we could say to parents, here's how it's gonna work. But I think we have a good enough understanding of the implications of trying to mitigate the population in the classroom, if you will. Um, because the second you try to do that, it triggers a whole bunch of needs um, with respect to both technology and, and PPE. Um, so we have met several times over the last several weeks and started getting uh, sharpening our pencils on this last Friday and even this Monday. Um, and and I'm trying to give context because this is all still a bit fluid. So here's the situation. Um, the PPE estimates that we are getting from our nurse leader, um, she was, that's Lynn Bowler for everyone who doesn't know, um, in, in working side by side with Keith Boudet, uh, our business manager. She did an excellent job at assessing um, what I would call the immediate needs for the nursing staff, um, as well as um, supplies and equipment. Um, but she she definitely took a conservative um, slash narrow focus in terms of the um, in terms of her sort of assumptions and expectations about where things are going to go next year. Um, and and the most critical thing is that at that. At the moment we last talked about this on Friday, she hadn't yet assessed what this financial scenario would look like if the CDC and or the state mandates that the schools have to supply masks and other PPE equipment for staff and students. We have to do that. That number is a big number, and I can't give you an answer right now, but I, I can tell you it would be um, significant because it would be about 3,000 individuals, students and staff, et cetera, that we would need to provide for, whether it's daily, weekly, or what that would look like, we don't know. So I can't go deeper into that today. Um, but she did give a conservative number just around the nurses and staff, et cetera. Um, and that's that's actually a much smaller number. It's it, Keith, did you refine the number before I say a number that's not right? Did you get it tighter since Friday? No, we just, uh, again, we, we, she has that working spreadsheet that I included with the submission to the fire chief. It's, we're looking at like 10 grand, maybe a little bit less even, just for the immediate nurses, office, et cetera. That does not include, it doesn't include additional staff yet, does it? Or did it include the additional? No, it doesn't. Okay. Um, so I want to put that piece aside. I just wanted you to know that that's still a question mark and a big consideration and something we're working through. Um, the second number, which is under the broad heading of technology, um, is a more immediate concern in that to provide students and staff with the necessary uh, devices in particular, some of the other things we need as well, um, we're looking at an 11 week lead time and Dan McLeod has done an excellent job. He's got a very thorough spread, spreadsheet on sort of all the implications for technology from software, hardware, infrastructure, et cetera. And inclusive in that is, um, are the devices for students and staff. And so that's one of our biggest challenges is that we're facing 
a very long lead time. Like we have to put in a PO for this stuff immediately to make sure we have it on hand in the fall. And I, I want to be fully transparent. Like we're preparing for a scenario where we really would need to be one-to-one from pre-K through 12. The good news is that this district has done a phenomenal job in getting most of the way there from three to 12. Um, And I think we're in pretty good shape, but it's the pre-K through two grades that are kind of exposed right now. And I think it's really important to point out right up front that we do not envision any kind of instructional model, you know, for the post 2021 year where those little learners are sitting in front of laptops all day long. Um, I don't think anyone's suggesting that that's ideal or appropriate, but we can't deliver the curriculum. They can't access the curriculum in a remote environment if we don't prepare for that. And that's one of the big concerns. So um, with Dan McLeod being the expert at the table, I'd like him to share with you his thoughts and assessments on what we would need, um, second grade, first grade, kindergarten, and pre-K to manage our way through, even if we're in a world, a hybrid world, where some students are in the classroom every single day, because we would still have some students at home. And that's that's the trigger, is that the second you have some portion of the population at home, we need to enable those students. So Dan, maybe you can talk a little bit about the um, work you've been doing, what you think we need, and what that looks like. Sure, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so yes, in Anne Louise is correct. We're looking at options for pre-K, K, and one. And those options include a Chromebook flip, which is essentially a tablet and a Chromebook uh, in the same device. And that touch is really important for students at those grade levels. For grade two, we have a plan uh, similar to our grades three to five, where we're gonna backfill those Chromebooks from what we recoup from eighth graders that are moving on to the high school and then our 12th graders that have graduated. We feel like we can uh, use those devices for another year and supplement grades two through five. So the issue for us is is pre-K, K and one. We really need to ramp up the devices we're providing to these students, the model we use for in, Instruction in this classrooms is not going to work. It's basically six devices per classroom right now. And with remote learning being um, a good possibility, we really want to provide a device for all students so that there's equity. Teachers can standardize instruction. The Chromebooks are filtered by the school system. We're very happy with our current content filter. And so for all these reasons, we are recommend that we go with the Chromebook flip for grades pre-K, K, and one. And that would complement the purchase that you approved back in 2017 for uh, 190 Chromebook flips for class and Tino. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, Mr. Murphy, well, you had your hand up and do you, did you I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that, Ken. I I just want to offer a couple of final thoughts and then your whole group should feel free to ask questions. There are just a couple of key things. I I don't think there's a single administrator that's assuming we're going back to school with 100% of the population physically on campus at any point in time. I'm not going to rule that out, but I think the likelihood's pretty darn low right now. Um, So we are assuming that some students will be trading on and off being and be at home for some portion of, you know, a week, a month, et cetera. Um, And that's the, that's the scenario that causes us to have to reevaluate the device delivery model um, or the device access model. Um, The second thing I, I, I suspect will come up is the question, well, how have you been getting by over the last month? and a half, two months, how long are we into this now? 10 weeks, um, two and a half months. 
and I think that's a really important thing. I'm sure Dan and Brad and Keith can talk to it more, but the bottom line is families kind of just sorted it out by trying to use whatever devices they had at home. Um, and that had some real downsides with respect to just, you know, was it appropriate for the child? Because, you know, if you're four years old, you're not using a keyboard. Um, the other challenge that we had is, you know, they're not consistent with the platforms that the teachers are using. And then we ran into issues where parents were saying, wait a minute, I didn't expect this pandemic to be this long. I kind of need my laptop back for work. Or they lost their jobs and had to get back their laptops. So the challenge that we're facing is we can't rely on what we've been doing over the past few months to be the plan for September moving on. So I guess that's it. Um, Anybody else, if you have questions for Mr. Alfred, Dan, Keith, et cetera. Did I miss the, the total price tag for the, the Chromebook flips? No, you didn't, she didn't tell us yet. Okay. So <laughs> do you want to tell us now or do you want me to go through a couple of Dan, Dan, do you want to, you want to um, share that? It's Sure. The, the Chromebook flips would be $72,450. And so, uh, again, Dan, would 7400 put? Seventy-two thousand four hundred fifty. Seventy-two thousand. I was going to say it seemed like I heard something was way too the three grades. But the total ask, Dan, for everything that we have an eleven-week time, eleven-week lead time on is what? Or Keith, maybe you. I don't know who's got the number. We're uh, yes. For, go ahead, Dan. Excuse me a second. I'm adding it up. The the two purchases are. Uh, I'm adding them up real quick. Hold on a second, please. That's all right. Brad texted me a number earlier, so I'm hoping it's well, the same I, number. I, 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 think, I think you're calculating a different number than Ann Louise is asking for. In addition to the Chromebook flips for grades K and 1, to round out the, um, so that we can one-to-one -one that both of those grades, um, we are also looking to move forward our Chromebook purchases for grade six and grade nine, because those have now 11 week lead times. Um, and uh, we yeah. don't feel we can wait until um, town meeting uh, to get those, um, those, uh, those on order so that they can be ready for the first uh, of the year. And also um, we uh, feel that the, we need to um, address the issues of um, um, laptops for our K through eight staff. Um, we, uh, our K to eight staff is currently equipped with Chromebooks, which, which pre-COVID were actually working quite well. But I have to tell you, if anybody's tried to um, either um, uh, participate in a Zoom session on a Chromebook or worse yet, record a Zoom session on a Chromebook, um, or use some of the advanced features such as waiting rooms, et cetera, those things are not supported on, on Chromebooks. So um, if we are going to ask teachers to continue to do this type of remote learning, they, we need to provide them with the equipment they need to do that. Um, so the total ask is, um, and we can send you the details, but the total ask is 343000 one hundred and nine dollars. Now, how much of this is COVID related? Well, I would argue that all of it is COVID related because um, we are we we need this equipment in order to uh, in order to function in the fall in a COVID environment. Okay, um, and so just a question though, say, you know, the, the, the mist rises and, you know, everything, uh, you know, suddenly becomes all right and everything's great. The, the Chromebook flips, we would sort of not be needing, right? For, for K and, and, and one, in theory? The Chromebook flips are not part of our current two to one model of, right. of technology at the um, K through um, four level, um, but we, um, uh, but th so that is true. But they could be shelved and 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 used later. Well, they can they can be shelved and used later. Absolutely. Um, the other two are definitely part. 
actually the other two, um, the Chromebooks, the bigger costs here, the Chromebooks and the instructional, the PCs for our instructional staff are, are essentially a quarter of a million dollars. And that's part of our, um, our uh, spring town meeting capital request um, that um, is uh, currently um, on, you know, awaiting um, uh, evaluation for annual town meeting. Um, so, I do. I, I, I want to finish up though, because what, what I'm, what I've been trying to get a little, and maybe Dan, you know better, like what would be the, the in a hybrid model, what would be the anticipated look of the, well, would there be a video camera in the classroom, additional monitors? I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm worried we're missing pieces that might also then be long lead times that we might not have for the opening of, of, of school. Or would the teacher just simply put up a, their new, you know, the, the laptop you're talking about and, and students at home from there and, and sort of point it to her in the classroom, her him or her in the classroom? Those those details, I mean, we haven't worked out yet, frankly, uh, but the um, uh, but without the PCs, there are there's no options. Well, I think it's, it's a really it's a really good question, Daniel. And actually, in uh, Dan's spreadsheet, he does have some of these items listed because he's been working pretty closely with um, the building principals and the teachers at each level. So. I mean, it maybe it's more fair to say we haven't we haven't pub published all those details, but he's got he's got insight on some of the um, in the classroom. Is that fair, Dan? Yes, it's uh, we're still working through those solutions. It's a good question. I agree. We're looking at options. We I have a meeting with one of these uh, solution specialists tomorrow at four p.m. So it's not finalized by any stretch, and uh, we, we are working th through those solutions. But we do need that PC laptop. We feel like that that is the crux of the issue, and that'll provide all of the flexibility that we we re require. Can you just talk to the camera that follows the teacher, just by way of examples? Because I think that's the kind of thing Daniel's wondering about, and probably the rest of the committee would be curious about. Sure. So one of the solutions we were looking at is basically it's an iPad that sits on a mount that rotates and tracks the teacher as they walk around the room. So the iPad serves as the camera and the recording device, and the iPad can also run the Zoom session at the same time. So the teacher could have one, the teacher would be essentially a guest in two Zoom sessions, one on their laptop and then one on the iPad for the remote learners. But the camera, the iPad tracks the teacher and the audio is via a necklace basically around the teacher's neck. And um, do, do we have the bandwidth to do this in the schools? Yes, so thanks to this committee, uh, we, we had a Wi-Fi refresh back Town in- meeting. Sorry? Town meeting. Town meeting, yes. Just don't thank us. <laughs> uh, he's, from, he's from Maryland. It's all different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the town of Holliston, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we, we actually refreshed our Wi-Fi, uh, especially at the middle school and high school. We had all new access points, state of the art, and then all new wiring at the same time. So very confident about those two buildings. At the elementary, we replaced the wiring because the access points were not quite up for um, renewal. So we feel okay because we, if half the students are home, then half of that traffic is at home and we can. I'm, I'm actually even more worried about the actual, the, the pipe coming in from the street. Yeah, so another uh, thing we, I guess we got a little lucky. Uh, Keith and I worked together and we looked at um, increasing our bandwidth at the high school, we doubled it. And then at the Woodland campus, we already had a one gig pipe. So we have two one gig pipes at both campuses. And we could, if we see a problem, we could reach out to the vendor and increase that bandwidth without, without much advance notice. But cost? 
um, to increase from 500 megs to one gig or one gig to two gigs? Or one to 10. I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't know how much of this stuff. I mean, if every single classroom is running eight hours a day or whatever. Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to get back to you on that price tag. I don't know if it's necessary. I, I don't know, but I, I, I just don't know. But it's just that it's a huge increase in, 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 in load. We, we had a good conversation about this yesterday, Daniel, um, and, and there's a lot that goes into the increase in load. It, you're absolutely right, which is one of the reasons I brought it up, but Dan, Dan pointed out that at any given point in time, it's possible, you know, with half the students home, they're loading on their own bandwidth, if you will, and running on their own bandwidth. Um, but he, he said he can flex the, uh, the pipeline pretty quickly. Um, and then we talked about, because it's e-rateable, how do you apply for that to get the reimbursement? So, um, so they are thinking through this, so they're, they're trying to estimate it, but if I'm not mistaken, you felt pretty comfortable, Dan, with where we were at on that. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll shut up and let someone else uh, well, have a question. If I, if I could just add one thing, though, I, because um, Dan's, Dan's description of how we would do something um, is only one of the only one of the models we we have not decided on an instructional model yet in the hybrid situation. So what you described, Dan, is a hundred percent synchronous model where twelve of our students are in the classroom and twelve are at home watching live. That is one viable model, um, but it's one of uh, of several that we're considering, and it may not work. For example at the elementary level where those students, kindergartners can't sit unsupervised in front of a, uh, in front of a, um, uh, a flip for f five hours a day. So um, there's a variety of different models we have to look at um, that uh, where, uh, but so I wanted to, that's why I answered the question why I did because um, how we would implement the instructional model you just asked about is Dan's answer, but that isn't necessarily the instructional model we're going to go with. We haven't made that decision right. yet. But it is the one that would put the greatest load on bandwidth, precisely because it would be everybody, if you will, but it's probably less likely. I get what you're saying. Um, the, the only other thing and I want to... It's also possible that it wouldn't be 100% of the time. I mean, traditionally in teaching, you do a mini lesson and then you have students break up into small groups. Um, and so there's all sorts of different, uh, you know, this, we have to remember teaching isn't just a teacher standing in front of a camera or a classroom talking and students taking notes. We have to be able to facilitate f small group discussions and all these other things and try to recreate these as best we can. So um, there's a mixture of different models that we'll be looking at. Okay, Mr. Murphy. I took myself off mute. Um, I just have a couple of questions regarding the iPad. Is this something included in your $343,000 budget you're proposing, or is that something additional for the iPad that moves around the classroom or follows the teacher around the classroom? Right, so we, we have iPads in the buildings that are before COVID, they were used as school-wide carts to uh, provide content creation devices for staff and students. So we, we're looking at those as a possible option as that iPad I mentioned in that model. Again, we're working through those discussions right now. So potentially, let's say they're not, they're too old, we need to get newer ones. How many new iPads and just a rough estimate of how much just ballpark, how much do you think it would cost? Well, does it have to be iPads? I mean, yeah, that's that, what you have, but you potentially could go with another tablet. There, yes, it could be another tablet. The iPad was the one that synced with this device, but there's other camera solutions out there. Again, it's still, I wish I could give you all of the answers right now, but we're working through all this uh, right now. So. so the question I'm having is, you gave us a quote of 343. 
in which I'll get to some of it, but this could also be more than 343, correct? Just so we get our heads around how much potentially we're gonna have to pay to get you guys up to speed. I think that's fair. Potentially could be more. Yes. Okay. It, it could, I agree. It could be more. This is what we tried to do here is since this is where I think we're talking more about the FY20 request as opposed yep. to the, um, we're trying to provide you with what we know now or what we think we know, what we're comfortable saying um, now and, um, and also uh, that coupled with the, uh, the high lead times for these Chromebooks um, is why we're, in, why we're coming to you now with a partial, understandably a partial um, solution. Um, but I think we can, I think you can look at these and know that they're not, they would work in, under multiple, multiple scenarios and would not be wasteful and why we would, why we feel comfortable bringing them forward in, in this context now. But then in answer to your questions there, well, um, there could very well be more um, additional type of, uh, of uh, technology. Um, and the other piece is that we haven't talked about, which isn't really capital per se, is um, a lot of the instructional technology that um, we may need. Right now, Zoom is, uh, you know, has been generous with the educational market um, because they uh, are obviously trying to grab us and reel us in. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? They have. And, uh, you know, who knows when that generosity is going to end. And here we are needing licenses. So, uh, you know, those things, those, the instructional technology, which, um, you know, which typically are annual licenses, and I don't recall if the FinCom considers those capital or not. No. Those may also be issues um, that we'll have to address further on down the line. Those are, those are items that um, Dan has already begun to itemize in uh, his analysis. And a number of them have what I would call the COVID-19 free trial. Okay. <laughs> um, and we, you know, he's, he's looking deeper into those to figure out a, you know, which ones are coming off free trial B are these solutions some of them are different based on um, the age appropriateness of the student, if you will, or the, or the teachers, um, you know, what the teachers are doing. So we're trying to figure out, is there opportunity to consolidate? If not, that's okay, but we need to understand why, et cetera. So um, he's, he's got a pretty good summary of this that I'm not sure anyone wants to be dragged through tonight, but he could show that as we get it tighter. The other question I have is, do you think any of this can be reimbursable by the grants? I'm concerned about the 250 because it's on our CapEx list for the, for beginning since January, but I think we could go after the 73,000 for the Chromebook flips as being well, something from one of these grants that we saw. So let me say this, that, you know, it's, it's such an unusual situation, right? It, we clearly, we're aiming for a more comprehensive one-to-one -one model, if you will, grades, you know, two and three and up. Um, but being forced into that by virtue of a pandemic, I think is a pretty solid rationale for tying this purchase to a grant. Um, All of it or just the 73,000? My concern okay. with the 250 would be it's something that was already in our works before this all started. An auditor could come back and say, well, how can you say this is for COVID-19 because you already had planned on doing this. I see it right here in the first draft of the warrant, blah, 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 blah. I, but the 73,000, this is the first time we're hearing about it for the flip. So I, that doesn't seem a problem. My only other concern with this, using that money, are we keeping track of it? We got 1.9 million, but- 1.3. Sorry, 1.3. Um, I, I was just going to do a happy dance, 1.9. Well, it's for the everything, so don't be joyous. So I don't, you know, I, it, it'll be used up quickly. So are we aware if Sharon's keeping track of, hey, this is stuff that we could be using and we have a forecast of this being used the, up? The answer to that, Ben, is yes. Okay. So, so could we, 
what's the thought about the 73,000 and the 250? My concern with the 250, as I mentioned, is I think we'd be hard pressed to argue saying, yeah, this is for the COVID-19. But, but then think about it this way. If we hadn't had it on our capital request, we'd have to purchase those devices. It doesn't matter. As you're looking at it from an auditor standpoint, they're going to say, well, you had, a, you had this planned. Sure, you're expediting the process, but you had the resources probably for this going in advance. So I put devil's advocate, let's be conservative. I mean, I <laughs> might be get out ruled in regarding the town treasurer and she could put it there. I would just be- Well, well I was, so. the only comment I'd make about that then is um, there was a request made, there was not an appropriation made. And I think that's a big distinction because in ordinary circumstances, we've discussed this at our meetings, right? In ordinary circumstances, there's a possibility that we would say the financial times are very tough right now. We're going to withdraw. Okay. Sure. Now we're forced into the purchase. That's where I think the, 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 the distinction comes in, right? I agree with you. If town meeting had already voted, if we had a town meeting in May and town meeting already voted, spend this money, and then the pandemic happens and we say, okay, well, now we'll go get money for it. Right. Yep. But you and I both know that if they came to us right now and said, we don't need, we don't absolutely have to have these Chromebooks, we would probably tell them, wait, because yeah. we don't know how it's going to go. We would not now we're being forced into a purchase. So, so I, think that makes we can sense. Also, I think we can also argue that COVID-19 has caused the delay in town meeting, which has caused us to be concerned about um, the lead times for being- Well, that's why the lead times are where they are. It's because of the crisis. Well- Six of one. I mean, to, yeah. the cause of the of that is irrelevant to me. We, if we had a Maytown meeting, we would have had the uh, devices in in hand. Uh, if but we didn't. So I, I'm again. I'm just trying to add to the argument. So can I ask, um, just Ken, from a process standpoint, these are capital items. Do we have the authority? And plus, I don't know if we have the reserve monies to allocate for this. This, what I would suggest for this is that we, we have a submission going to the state in three days for our first tranche of what do we need reimbursed. Uh, my suggestion would be that's where we make the request. Um, if the understanding I currently have, and the, certainly the impression, and certainly Mr. Cassidy could, when we get to him, he could add additional color. Um, the intent of the CARES money, for obvious reasons, is to get it into our hands as quickly as possible, right? So, so I would expect that if it is approved for reimbursement, we would have the money. Remember, with 11-week lead time, we're not going to get the bill for three months. True. Right? So the one of two things will happen in that time. We will either have it approved and we'll have the reimbursement money, or we'll have it not approved and then we can bring it up to town meeting and say, we have to do this, right? And then it becomes, it's problematic in the sense that we have to, you know, the other only other option would be to fund it out of existing funds if we had to, if the town said no. So, but, but, but there are several ways we could deal with it. But I mean, the primary way in my mind to deal with this is to submit it through this uh, application on the fifth and see what happens. So hypothetically, the town says no, what, where are we, are we between a rock there and are hard two options, Right, there are two options. One is, the most direct option is it comes out of the school budget. I mean, that's what has to happen, right? It comes out of the school budget. Now, the, the, the question then becomes, okay, depends on when the bill comes in, which school budget it comes out of. Does it come out of FY21? It looks like it'll come out of FY21 because we're not going to get the bill for three months, right? So the bill comes out of FY21. We have several options, which is either, you know, in, in uh, if, you know, once town meeting approves a budget in July, uh, you know, then either that, Again, we can either, either in that budget, if they don't approve it in the budget or the capital, then we could either revisit in October or at that point, we'll have the reserves available to do that because we'll be putting away the money for the reserves to, to cover COVID related expenses. So I'm not that concerned, to be honest with you, not, not because I'm thinking it's going to get approved easily. That's not it. I'm saying there are several ways by which we could fund this if, if we had to. The preferential way is it's, as I said before, from my perspective, the debate about whether we have to buy this goes away because we have to buy it under the new scenario. So to me, it's a reimbursable expense through our CARES money. If that doesn't happen, we have other options, but I, I'm not concerned about those because I really do think there's a valid case to say, 
we, we can't say no. Okay. okay. So that's it for me. Okay. Uh, let's see, Ben, you had your hand up. I guess you don't, you don't now, but, uh, okay. I'll go to, uh, Ms. Michelle. I don't know whether you were sewer first. So, so Michelle, um, you're up. Isn't, should we fund it? It was more the mechanism for funding it, which I guess we discussed right now. Um, but I, I did have a question for, um, I guess, Dr. Jackson, and it um, goes towards all, all the different models. And my, my daughter took um, Mandarin through the, the tech collaborative. And I was wondering if you've looked through the, the tech collaborative as, as one of your models for, um, for uh, teaching, at least for the high school level, for students, you know, having more, more classes available as, as one of the options for the models. Well, yeah, um, yes, we actually, through um, tech, we have an agreement with TECA, which is the uh, virtual school district, uh, one of two virtual school districts in Massachusetts, where Holliston receives over 100 free courses a year due to our role in the founding of TECA, the online school district. So um, we use those currently, um, and they will be part undoubtedly of, of our opportunities moving forward. Um, in addition, there's been some talk at the state level of creating some additional um, online courses for high school students that districts can share uh, more uh, formally um, that we can use to supplement. Um, so certain students, we may have students who choose not to return um, to or who are, who's who are immunocompromised and whose doctor feels it's unsafe for them to return to school at all. Um, and we would have to provide them with a 100% remote learning environment. Um, and that, um, and in addition to being one of the constant people at home in the model that Mr. Alfred was talking about, they could also go to, um, to take courses through another venue, uh, you know, that's another possibility, I think, Michelle, that you're suggesting, and I agree, it is one. It's very possible that we're gonna have students, um, some of whom are going to be in school all day, every day, mm -hmm. some of whom are going to be not in school at all, and some of whom are gonna be in school some days and not in school other days what grades those are, what ages those are, what times of the year those are, is going to be driven partially by the, by the rate um, that the, uh, by the virus and its current status and, yeah. uh, the, and what we're being told. Uh, but we are trying to be flexible with all of these models and try to make them as student-centered as possible because one size fits all is not gonna work in this situation. Yeah, because it was a really good opportunity for her to take a class, you know, the, that there weren't a lot of students in Holliston that wanted to take it. So it was a really good opportunity for her. Agreed. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Ms. Nersessian, I believe you were next. I was just wondering um, if you had a sense of when your sort of drop dead date is for planning out the fall. Um, and just, I would, I guess I'm presuming you'll come back at that point and just have a, the layout of sort of any additional costs that may come to fruition. The state, um, com the commissioner of education actually had a uh, zoom conference with all of the superintendents of the state today and essentially told us that they are still on track to provide statewide guidance, um, on or about June 15th. Okay. Um, he reiterated um, and actually was very strong in his recommendation that districts not do too much planning until that time because the intention of DESE is to be actually very prescriptive as to what model they want school districts to implement. Um, which is very unusual from this commissioner and very unusual from uh, from DESE, but they feel that um, that um, it is really the best way to implement this is through a, um, 
a primarily a statewide model as opposed to 351 cities and towns doing their own thing. Um, that being said, um, the suggestion, the assumption and the imp implications of his conversation suggest that a, uh, uh, a hybrid model is the way the plan, the way we should be planning um, that uh, uh, the uh, community and the state needs to get back to work. And not only is education important for the sake of education, but we've now learned what an important role it plays is uh, in, in as, as helping to drive the economic engine of our um, Commonwealth because it provides um, it provides uh, support for our children so parents can work. So um, uh, that's the that's the implications we've been given. Um, after June fifteenth, then we will. What right now we have task forces in each of our schools that are studying um, the unique nature and developmental needs of our students at each level. Um, it's very likely that a 50-50 hybrid model might will look very different at Placentino than it would at uh, the high school. For example, some districts, and I'm not suggesting this is something we're seriously considering, but some districts are actually saying, you know what, we're going to put our high school kids on 100% remote learning, and all of our K-2 students, we're going to split up and um, using um, attached classrooms, 12 kids in one room, 12 kids in another, a teacher in the middle, and they're gonna come to school every day. Those are some of the models that districts are considering. The state is saying, time out, we're gonna, we'll, we'll give you some guidance here. Uh, we hope to have that information again by June 15th. I would hope by July 15th to August 1st, we'd have a pretty solid plan that we could begin to um, share, uh, but not only, um, um, you know, and I think before that, uh, we'll be able to share with um, the school committee and, uh, and uh, the finance committee so that we can assure we have the resources to implement it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Maxwell. So there seems to be a significant amount of risk and moving forward with this plan. We, we don't understand our methodology. Uh, Desi is announcing um, guidance, guidelines on June 15th. Why the push to secure this $343,109 today and, and not in two weeks? Brad, can I just respond quickly and then um, would love for you to elaborate. Um, Tim, I can completely appreciate sitting on the other side of this Zoom screen how this feels because, you know, there's so much detail behind it. I don't think the risk is in the, uh, the need for devices, if you will, or the need for potentially for PPE. The variability in how the plan will be implemented is definitely there. But once again, the second we are looking at a scenario where some portion of the population on some variable basis is remote learning, that means every student in the district needs to be enabled. And that, that is probably the one thing we can say with a very high degree of certainty. And, and that's the first challenge. Um, the second piece is that we are already well behind schedule, if you will, in terms of trying to order some of this stuff. Um, an 11-week lead time, if you do the math, it's almost four months, puts us, I think it puts us just past it's, it's, September it's 1st. late August. It's late August, right yeah. there. So we're kind of down to the wire. And that assumes that those lead times don't change as every other district in the Commonwealth and the nation puts in orders for Chromebooks and other devices. I'm genuinely concerned about that. I don't want to be caught flat-footed on the back end of a supply curve that, you know, a supply chain that isn't, you know, where, where the pipeline is starting to um, get extended because they just don't have supplies. 
So I think I think the the risk you're hearing is that Desi could come down and say, well, we want you to handle it this way versus that way in terms of, you know, how a classroom might be configured or the number of kids in a building. But I think we know right now there's no scenario where 100% of the kids are coming to school 100% of the time. And that's the challenge. Um, and I, I agree, that, that, that's the That is the thing we know with certain, with relative certainty is that in, excuse me, in the fall, we are not going to be opening with all of our students in the classroom. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I should never try to eat while I'm at a meeting. Um, sure you're not feverish and uh, you know, not tasting or smelling we, anything. No, we will not be uh, we will not be opening uh, for uh, with um, all our students um, in, normally in the fall. That the likelihood of that to me is extremely high and that coupled as Anne louise said with the long lead times i think makes it um, imperative for us to take action sooner rather than later one other point brad you can probably offer more tangible examples but you know desi is it's interesting the kind of directives that come down from desi um more often than not in in the last decade or so they've been unfunded mandates i think everybody's very well aware of that. Um, the second thing is that if there's one thing Desi has been consistent on, it is their concern for equity and equal access. Equity and equal access in a pandemic translates into making sure every child is provided for. And that is precisely our concern. Um, I think the other thing that we may hear from, from Desi is that you know, because of that, their, their model is actually going to be more conservative rather than less conservative, if you will, meaning they will expect more of districts than what um, we may be even anticipating. So I don't know. Can you talk further on that, Brad? I mean, that I don't that that, that I think reduces the risk that we would purchase stuff that wouldn't be needed, if you will. Yeah, I think, um, as I said, the, the DESI um, guidelines are not going to say, uh, um, are going to say, this is how we want you to do um, hybrid. This is the, these are the features of the hybrid model we want you to implement. Not, uh, and um, so it is, um, you know, in a hybrid model, one-to-one -one technology is essential, period, hard stop. To me, that's, that's, that's the issue. So um, I don't think there's any risk waiting for DESI's guidelines because uh, unless, you know, the only scenario under which this technology would not be needed um, First of all, even if we went back a hundred percent, we need this techno need all of this technology except the flips. Um, uh, just that's why they were part of our uh, initial request. Uh, this is this is accelerated because of the supply side challenges we're facing. Well, in the needs of the pandemic. Okay, Mr. Alfred. Yeah, we've been talking about this for a while, so I just want to be really done. Yeah, Tim was done. That's why. Um, so I just, just, I know we've been talking about this for a while, and I just want to sort of, you know, uh, um, to let everyone know. I mean, you know, Michelle, Ken, and I, we've been working with the schools weekly on this, uh, you know, very, very closely in hours after hours after hours meetings. And uh, as everyone knows, I'm 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 loath to just start doling money out to the schools anyway. But um, you know, this is this is something that you know is is absolutely going to be needed. And you know, we've been sort of struggling over how to how to how to even find the money. And given the sort of the, the, the dynamics of town meeting when it is, and the, you know, the, the inability to do capital uh, before town meeting, and and all those things, and um, you know, using the using the uh, COVID fund that we have, you know, is seeming like a, a, a it's a good use of it, and, and, and you know we 
I think it's acceptable given you know the issues that we have. I don't think that if we had that money, if we didn't have the, the COVID money and we didn't have the need at the school to do it, that we would be able to afford it this year. So I don't think that I would be voting in favor of, of, of the, the, the Chromebooks, um, just given the, the economic situation. Um, but since we do need them and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's important that we, we, we try to do as we need to do it quickly because we have to submit this thing by Friday. And, right, um, and that was the other thing I was going to point <clears> out to <throat> Maxwell. The, the reason that there's an urgency is because the submission deadline, our submission for the first tranche of money is due June 5th. So if we wait two weeks, we've missed that opportunity. And then, and then, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I don't, we don't need to go into this, but as they've explained, there's, there is some some prep time. You don't just get the, the the Chromebook in and hand it right back out. There's some, you know, work that needs to be done to, to get them all up to speed. So even if you get them in right before school starts, it may be that not everyone has them for, for a couple of weeks even after that. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm supportive and, and I don't want to take any more time up unless other people have questions, but um, I just wanted to sort of wrap, sort of, you know, sort of let everyone know that we, this is not the first that the, the, the budget subject is hearing about this. Any other questions? Okay, then then I think that, I mean, you don't need a, it doesn't need to be a formal vote from us, but I think that um, in general, and this kind of morphs with the, uh, you know, with our, our next agenda item, which was the, the planned submission on, on uh, Friday for the funding. Um, I think that we would, uh, I mean, again, we can entertain a formal motion if somebody wants to make a motion that we recommend that the select board include $343,109 for equipment for the schools and the request on Friday, then I would uh, move forward. Set. Second. Okay. Any further discussion on that motion? Okay, let's proceed to a roll call vote. Mr. Sparrow? Yes. Ms. Zemer? Yes. Mr. Alfred? Yes. Ms. Nersessian? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Maxwell? Yes. Okay, and I vote aye, so that's, uh, that carries unanimously. Okay, do you have any other uh, issues you wanted to discuss while you're here, Louise? I think that's... that's... I have a question. What about the $10,000 that was discussed originally? Does that have to go anywhere, or was that... The PPE? Uh, yeah. Brad, how do you want to handle that? They, th this is the that information's uh, already been forwarded to Sharon and uh, Chief Cassidy, along with all of the other other COVID expenditures that we've already made uh, okay. that are going to be included in reimbursement. This okay. is an expenditure that hasn't been made. Well, okay, but wait. So the forgive me. The stuff we went over on Friday with uh, Lynn Bowler is what she's anticipating needing for next year as opposed to what we've already incurred. So okay, so FY21, so that's separate. It is separate. I mean, it, let's put it this way. I think it could be handled in the part two request, if you will. Assuming the lead times don't get worse. So that's the only other thing we're watching, but it's- well, On the PPE side, right? That yeah. Chief Cassidy is watching that very closely on the PPE side, I'm sure, so. Yeah, I mean, as it stands right now, because, so this is the one where it's like a big fat question mark. If the CDC or the state mandates we buy masks, that's a big number, it's a big number fast, and supply is gonna be a bigger issue. Well, that's what I was gonna say. If that's a mandate that comes down at, even at the state level, the availability of the equipment is going to become a problem. You know, the stuff's going to become a problem very quick. Yes. And we don't know that right now. There, There's much more risk around the certainty. There's much less certainty around that than there is around the need for devices. So I think we're content for the moment to put that in the part two request, Brad. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay, so I guess we're done with the, you know, you guys can hang out if you really want to and have nothing better to do. As I said to Mr. Keist, right? If you have nothing better to do on a Tuesday night, you can feel free to hang out. Otherwise, uh, I just we'll, uh, some of us will see you tomorrow morning. Yes, you will. You're getting getting so sick of us, I think. But I I just want to say thank you, um, Ken, Daniel, and Michelle have spent an inordinate amount of time weekly participating in our budget subcommittee calls. It has been a very open and honest series of discussions. Um, by the way, we're about to prove minutes from like the last bunch of those meetings. So, um, but I can't tell you how helpful it's been. And I think it's also, if I may, just 
it's it's kind of elevated the relationship of these two boards because there's been such fluid conversation back and forth. I think it's really helped us understand each other and, and the concerns on both sides. And um, gosh, if there's been any silver lining to all of this, that's one of them. So thank you so much, everybody. You've always been supportive, but this is remarkable and, and helpful. So thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you for the kind words. Yes, I see. We don't get we don't get that very often, so <laughs> yeah. we take, we take them while we can get them. So. Pay for it. <laughs> no, we think to it at the last school committee meeting, but uh, it's want to be able to say thank you in one of your meetings. You guys really have gone above and beyond, so thank you. You're welcome. We're just doing our job. So okay, well as you I said, you guys are welcome to hang out if you want to. Uh, if you you know. Keith, you're welcome to berate your son before you leave if you want to. <laughs> can I can I just also thank Keith and Dan and uh, thank you. Uh, and Dr. Jackson and um, Dan McLeod and Peter Batello because they have been working nonstop to trying to pull all of this together. And it's as you can tell, there's still so much to be done, but they've they've done a lot. So thanks to our crew there. All right, that's my comment. Happy to do it. Okay. Good night, Bye. everybody. Bye -bye. Bye, Bye. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Cassidy, Chief Cassidy, we have the next couple of things both concern you, so we'll just go to that, which is the submission, which we just discussed, you know, from the school's perspective, um, in terms of pandemic-related expenses, and obviously any updates on expenses that we're seeing right now. So you want to give us the the current status? Sure, I'll do it in reverse order. Uh, based on the most recent printout that Sharon provided to me uh, on the municipal side, we've spent about $15,000 in what's been posted through Munis, and the schools have spent approximately $25,000. Those expenses, uh, which have already been incurred, plus projections from all departments of what would be not only be incurred through the end of this fiscal year, but also possibly through the end of the calendar year, were all rolled, rolled up into a spreadsheet, uh, which formed the basis of my recommendation last night to the board of select, uh, uh, that we look for $150,000 from the CARES Act reimbursement, um, based on a follow-up conversation with Sharon today, um, and as evidenced by your conversation with the members of the school committee and the school department staff a little while ago, we recognize that 150,000 was not going to uh, probably capture everything, that something might be missed. So she'd actually recommended that we bump that up to 175. Uh, but based on what I heard this evening, I think my recommendation to the board uh, is going to be a much higher number than 175 by the time Thursday night rolls around. Okay. So that uh, so so how are we doing in general with respect to you know I ask you this question every time you're here which is you know PPE you know health you know how are we doing on the public health response to is there financially are we are we okay are we so, still looking so so PPE wise we're we're in good shape uh, it continues to be prorated based on what your purchases from uh, vendors were pre previously. So uh, our main medical supply vendor looks at what our six month prior history of purchases was and uh, prorates anything that comes down through the supply chain and is made available based on what we'd uh, ordered previously. Obviously we have reached out to some new vendors and we've tried to get stuff wherever we can, but I'm comfortable that we have a, a good supply right now for uh, the immediate need as well as the anticipated uh, potential surge this fall. Okay, so so just just for my own and probably obviously from the committee's perspective, one one more thing about that, which is, you know, obviously there was the initial supply crunch, right? When this all hit and everybody's looking for N95 masks, um, are we seeing any signs that with all these businesses and factories being converted and other you know things like that that we're starting to see better availability in general of like I mean I'm just thinking ahead to. Are we going to have capacity if it comes down that we need more N95 masks in the fall for a fall surge? Are we going to just be back in the same thing of everybody bidding, you know, paying $10 a mask? Or are we going to, do we think that all this extra supply is going to, is starting to hit now? I think it's going to be somewhere between the two of those. Um, 
I know that our governor has collaborated with several other governors to enter into a cooperative purchasing uh, collaborative so that uh, when they're competing against the federal government and other large purchasing blocks uh, that we're better positioned to be able to obtain uh, blocks of PPE. Um, right now, we have the ability, uh, if there's an urgent need, uh, to source things through the state, but they are urging us to work through our regular vendors. Uh, we haven't gotten to the point yet where we've, we've ever been at a uh, an immediate need for, we, we didn't have a seven-day supply available with anything. So um, as for the supply chains that have been converted, factories that are now producing masks that weren't previously producing masks, uh, we haven't seen any of those enter our supply chains yet. Uh, I believe that uh, the estimates I heard were that it was about a 12-week lead time from when they converted their processing to when some of those uh, items would be available to the general market. So we're, we're not quite at that point yet, uh, but we're certainly paying close attention. Okay, so, so the expectation would be that if we do see a fall surge, that these additional sources will be online. Uh, yes, uh, they would be online in as much as they were put into warehouses and were uh, being held in inventory because the question is uh, how long those industries would continue to be con um, manufacturing alternative products, PPE, and right. at what point they went back to manufacturing cars and uh, non-medical equipment that they'd done previously. Right, okay. Okay, so Sue, you had a question? I did. So was the 150 to 175 that you were talking about, um, is that inclusive of uh, PPE, cleaning, disinfecting um, for, um, for town employees? So I was thinking about like the summer camp employees. I don't know if the library will eventually, is there a plan to open, but maybe town hall, et cetera. Does that include all of it through, I think you said end of calendar year? So that number included estimates from municipal and school departments. Uh, and so I did hear from Parks and Rec. I heard from uh, library. I uh, have been coordinating with our facilities manager. So yes, uh, we, we did uh, put a projected PPE and sanitation and cleaning supplies expense uh, embedded into that 150 to 175. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And that also included the the hundred in PPE uh, that was mentioned earlier by representatives from the school committee and the school district. Okay, and then also the um, I know um, Mr. Keats had been talking about the um, the partitions. Does that include that as well? That was in the 150 to 175. So that was sort of the, the mid-range between what's already been incurred and is in Munis versus what has been ordered but not arrived or invoiced as opposed to what is projected for the future. So there were sort of three stages of the way the spreadsheet played out. Okay, fabulous. Thank you very much. Certainly. Mr. Alfred. Let me let me ask you a question that I don't think you're going to be able to answer, at least in any way that you'd feel comfortable with the, the definitive answer on. But uh, just just say we, just say we all went back. You know, the schools went back full time, but uh, Desi had uh, has is dictated that they everyone wear a mask and you know to ensure that there's no contamination. You basically are handed a, the the children are, and and employees are handed a mask as they enter the school for the day, a disposable mask, and so you need two to three thousand masks a day at the school. And all the schools start buying this um, uh, simultaneously. Do you think there's supplies in the stockpile to fund that for, let's just say, even just three to six months to start? And, and you know, no. And and that's why when you see guidance being released, and you'll you'll see a lot of my public messaging is always CDC approved face coverings, because there's a, a difference between the masks versus. CDC approved face coverings. And, and this was part of the, the challenge for those of us in the medical uh, community early on is that as soon as the, the outbreak occurred in other countries, uh, a lot of civilians went out and bought a much higher grade of mask than they needed as a civilian, which kept it from being available for the healthcare workers. So if uh, DESI provides guidance, which is consistent with CDC guidance, I think that there will be ways for us to ensure 
that we have universal source control uh, to try and minimize disease transmission without causing a significant challenge to the supply chain. And, and honestly, because this is going to be a, an entirely new paradigm, I'm, I'm thinking that we're going to be approaching this the same way we do other items that we expect students to show up to school with. If it's a chilly day, we hope that their parents are gonna send them in a sweatshirt or a sweater. Um, so if we know that X percentage of the school population is going to be in the building, uh, and the expectation is that when you're in the, the school building and you can't maintain so physical distancing that you're supposed to have a CDC approved face covering, the expectation is the parents will send their child with an approved face covering. Yes, we will have some spare on hand and we do need to uh, address the issue of uh, what is the employer's role with regards to providing uh, approved face coverings for their staff uh, but that's still not going to be at the three thousand dollars a day um, level. So my so my understanding is, if you go into a hospital now, you 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 actually can't wear your own mask, right? They require you to wear a mask inside because they're looking to control. My only concern is if the if the, if the CDC changes the guidance or DC changes the guidance because they actually want they they don't want to risk a, a student bringing a mask to school that had been at home coughed on by a parent that had that had COVID, and therefore I I look I get that this is the most conservative way of possibly approaching this because sure. all the mask is you know and and back to your point at the beginning people were buying masks to, to protect themselves and then they and that really they weren't really effective for protecting yourselves because everyone touches the mask and it, it doesn't work unless you're in an actual hospital or a controlled setting and you're taught how to actually use it and then it's certainly flipped and it's confused everyone because now everyone is wearing a mask to protect other people and therefore if everybody's wearing a mask it's you're not actually wearing it for yourself you're wearing it for for everybody else but I'm still thinking if you're going into the school and the school is trying to create a bubble where there, there's that, that's the, you know, anyway, we can approach that later. But I mean, you know, it's, you don't have to have a discussion of epidemiology right now. So, yeah. And, and face coverings is just one tool in the toolbox being used to minimize disease transmission. Uh, a lot of the guidance that's going to be coming out from DESI, uh, we anticipate will relate to physical space, how many people you can have in a specific classroom or um, instructional area, uh, what the requirements are for sanitizing and for cleaning, uh, everything from food service to recreation. So masks is just a small component of the new uh, environment that our schools are going to sure. be facing uh, this fall. So the answer that would be your anticipation is that you don't believe Desi or the state is gonna require students to wear reusable masks. And I'm not even talking N95, I'm you know, even just sort of the, the plain sort of surgical mask that you know any dentist office in the past would use and just sort of i would never be so presumptuous as to think that i could anticipate the guidance that desi would come out with later this week or later yeah. this month but i i do anticipate that physical distancing and face covering in accordance with cdc guidelines will continue to be part of uh the messaging and the the guidance issued by state agencies yeah. well as soon as we know if the if if there's something changes we'll definitely need to but it doesn't seem like we want to buy all these masks now, especially if, if face coverings of any sort are going to be. Yeah, well, well, you know for sure, right? If if the face covering, if face coverings are mandated, and there's a, the expense is either going to be near zero or a lot. There's not going to be an in between, right? Either they're going to require protection that we have to provide at some level. Or they're going to, or to the chief's point, it's going to be something where you're going to be expected to provide it yourself. And, you know, so that's why I said my expectation, and you know it full well, if it's a lot of money, if they, Desi comes back and says, okay, every single person needs an N95 mask when they walk through a school, not only we're we not going to be able to get those, but, but you know right away that you're talking a massive amount of money and that becomes untenable. So there's no way we're not going to hear, you know, I mean, we're going to hear if that, if something that comes through that costs a lot of money. But a K9 N95 mask for all your dogs. Okay, that's right. So, Mr. Sparrow. Hi. Yes. Um, thank you, Chief, for uh, this information. I appreciate you uh, providing it. Um, you know, we talk a lot about masks and cleaning supplies and things like that. But um, has the CDC provided any guidance about things like? Um, air filters or HVAC or anything like that for um, like air conditioning and things like that. Um, I mean, you know, 
you know, a lot of these are just kind of stories and things like that, but are there, you know, we have to replace the filters weekly or, or is there anything along that line that's being uh, suggested for, uh, for these facilities? So guidance has gone out from several trade organizations that not only is CDC uh, guidance, but also uh, organizations such as ASHRAE and NIOSH, and they are addressing things such as the level of filter that you're required to have in your um, air handling equipment, which mostly is what we already had uh, in terms of the level of filtration that was required. Um, so there shouldn't be a significant ramp up. It's not like we're going to, to need to go from the 99 cent filter that you could pick up at Ocean State Job Lot to now needing the uh, $200 filter for 40 air handlers at each building. So it's it's not that kind of a, a, a scale up that would be required. And and there's no like additional cleaning that needs to take place to the uh, the venting or anything like that. Uh, not any more than than all of the other high touch and high traffic areas that uh, we're already focusing on, which was okay. built into the model that we used uh, with regards to increased sanitation um, and also additional. Um, devices to be able to do uh, a lot of that cleaning um, and electrostatic sprayers uh, in-house as opposed to always needing to bring in someone from the outside. The, the school currently has a couple units, but part of the number that we included in the 150 to 175 uh, included uh, acquisition of a few other units for the schools. Okay. Thank you. Sure. You know, what I'm, what I'm thinking is if any of you have ever seen the movie Bubble Boy, that's what we're going to provide to every student, right? They're going to walk around their bubble with their, right? The, uh, okay. So, so one other thing that, that kind of segues, we, we've covered the, 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 the submission, we've covered the financial status relative to COVID-19, and now the next thing on our agenda is FY21 budgeting. But since you're here, Chief, obviously one thing related to that is, uh, have you, I don't know if you updated the select board on town meeting plans for July 20th. What, you know, what, what is the thinking on your part from the safety perspective of, you know, do we think that there's going to be a, a way to do this? So uh, I have had some preliminary conversations with uh, members of the board regarding what the July town meeting would look like. Uh, I had held off on providing them a formal uh, draft for their meeting last night because there's actually a conference call tomorrow uh, being put on by MMA with regards to uh, the conduct of both uh, local elections as well as annual town meetings. And so I thought it would, it would behoove us to get best practices from around the state um, before we tried to put the stake in the ground as to what ours will look like this spring. But there, there is nothing based on current guidance and projected guidance that would preclude me from uh, feeling that we would be able to come up with a safe um, venue and flow and organization to be able to hold a uh, town meeting in July. Okay, good. Yeah, that, that's, that's kind of what I, was, what, I, what I wanted to know. So can I just kind of translate? Uh, what you just said was that we should be able to hold town meeting in July without any drastic changes to the health situation. Well, Dan, as you know, I'm a uh, I'm a professional politician. My undergraduate, my, undergraduate, my undergraduate degree from the other institution in Cambridge across the river um, the, the, the be, bad one? Yeah. would be in, in, in government, uh, and therefore I am a professional politician. Uh, I, I would not uh, disagree with your characterization that I was suggesting that we could have town meeting in July without uh, any further concerns. Okay, good. Yeah, because I, I mean, I, yeah, the, 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 you know, as I said, I'm not implying anything on anybody's part. I'm just saying that that's obviously something that as a committee we've discussed and we've been in, in pretty much unanimous agreement that we, you know, we really do need to get. I mean, to, to wit, the entire discussion we just had with the school committee is a product of not being able to have a town meeting earlier in the last month, right? So, so th there is a, you know, there's a need to get this business done. And, and the one other question I was going to ask you about that was, um, I know that other towns, some have already had a town meeting, like they've really done the reduced quorum, 
Others are planning for ones before July 20th. Um, so, you know, ha ha in any ways, is that part of your analysis as well? In other words, looking, I, I think it was somebody told me Medfield either had one or is having one. And I think Needham is also had one or ha is having one shortly. So, you know, all I was saying was those are opportunities to find out, okay, how did you do it, right? Are we, are we in that Absolutely. kind of communication? Yeah, so we've, we've got two different opportunities for additional input tomorrow. Uh, first of all, I'm meeting with the, the town, or I'm discussing with the town clerk uh, tomorrow, and she's got a great network among the other town clerks, so she'll certainly have access to what's working and, and what uh, is being planned for other communities. And then, as I said, we've got the MMA conference call in the evening. Uh, I was sent an article earlier uh, from uh, one of the members of my board that showed that uh, Southboro has announced that they're going to be doing theirs outdoors. Um, I, I have concerns about how that would work locally for us, but uh, again, we're looking to be creative, but at the same time, we're gonna be safe. But again, um, I would not be, um, I, I can be backed into a corner to suggest that we should be able to have the annual town meeting in July this year. Okay. This is on a, on a date certain. <laughs> Uh, date certain, right? Yes, Sharon. Uh, but just for reference point, Mary did tell me that the town of Blackstone had their town meeting outside in their soccer field. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't want to take up time tonight to discuss with you, Chief. But, but I would be curious as to what your concerns are about an outdoor town meeting. I'm sitting there going, "This would be great," rather than being in the auditorium, you'd be outside and get some fresh air on a nice summer day. I, I would love to have them outside normally. So. What? I don't want to burn. <laughs> yeah, come on. Just remember, Triple E's just around the corner. Yeah, well, this, if we wait past July, then it is around the corner, right? So, the, uh, but, uh, okay. So any other questions for the chief in terms of the pandemic response, uh, the finances we discussed about the submission? Okay. Okay, as, as the select board is going to finalize the submission on Thursday night. So if anybody wants to, you know, just as a reminder to the committee, if anybody wants to see what they end I'll up there. doing, you know, uh, yeah. So, okay. Well, thank you very much, Chief. You're helpful as always. Are we, just one quick question, are we still doing well on the case side of things? Uh, we remain at 56 where we, we have been for several days. Uh, included in that 56 is 31 who have reported uh, having resolved one COVID-related fatality from late March, and that re leaves 24 cases remaining as active. Okay, good, good. Sounds like things are calming down around here, and that would be a good thing. Okay, well, thank you very much, Chief. You're, you don't have to stay if you're, if you're all done. You can enjoy your Tuesday evening, as I said. Um, okay, so that's a good segue into FY21, and that's why we have Sharon here. So for those of you who did check your email, uh, Sharon sent out the 112th budget that the select board approved last night. Um, they would like us to weigh in on it in terms of, you know, obviously we know that technically they don't have to ask us under the law, uh, but they have reached out to us, uh, which I, I think is a good thing to, to get our take and any feedback we have on what they have proposed. So. Uh, I guess we can start, if anybody's looked at it and they have specific questions for Sharon, um, we can start with that and then we can talk about the general budget as a whole, the 112 budget and what, what our feedback should be. Okay, Mr. Sparrow, you were first. Um, it's a, not a huge thing, but the, uh, the zoning um, appeals board number that 855.83 is not uh, 112, it's actually 7.5%. So it would need to be um, raised up to 950. 58 oh, to be you are, you're to, right, well because you're right i took uh the 2021 budget and it's lower than last year so i will yes now yeah that was the only one i just i wanted to make okay. sure that they were all 112 so um, but otherwise um, yeah, and, and, and we went through all of them last night and we all missed that one there was a lot so i totally understand well, well i will i will just tell you that the funny thing was the first thing i did when i got this was i took the spreadsheet added two columns and created a 112 column and then looked at the difference. And so it pops out right away when you do that. It says, you know, 94.75 short in that budget. So. Right. Okay. But, uh, it's 
Yep. Okay. Uh, Mr. Alfred, is that it, Mr. Farrell? Okay. So, uh, Dan? So I, I watched a lot of this, uh, unfortunately. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't go there. Just stick to the budget. No, no, it, was just, it was just a lot, a lot. Um, but, Sherry, can you just confirm that as far as you know, that any department that has any extraordinary expenses in the month of July that's normally paid is included in this budget and otherwise it's simply one twelfth of, of, of the expenditure and I understand the managerial salaries is part of that and that's another issue but but as far as you know all the extraordinary July costs are, are included so that all those can be paid yes okay and then we have the, as far as you know we we also have the funds because we obviously haven't gotten our, our you know state monies and stuff yet we have the funds to 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 cover the, the amount of cash that we know, that know is going to go out the door because I know that there are certain of these budgets, like ours, for instance, our three hundred dollars or whatever thirty dollars is, is is not actually going to be spent, um, and that there are really other departments. They don't sell us short. It's one hundred twenty-seven dollars. Sorry, one hundred twenty-seven dollars. Um, but we have the, of the known monies that are going to go out because I know there are a number of substantial payments. We have the the, the funds for that to be paid. Yes. So we we increased what was in the highway. So if they started any of the up branch stuff, they had money available. Uh, we increased Board of Health for Scott Moles because he had expenses that he knew was coming. Um, you know, so yes. So anybody who needed a little extra, we gave him a little extra. Um, and, you, and you were also able to get Scott to 40 hours, right? I know he had brought in. A oh, yeah. He's right. yes. Because, yep. you know. <laughs> The health director should be should be uh, working forty hours a week uh, during a pandemic. Uh huh. And we should find that, that money. <laughs> so, okay, great. That's all. I don't need to review line by line. Certainly. Okay, uh, Sue. Yeah, I was just wondering um, with Keith Tech, it was divided by four. Um, so I was just curious as to uh, what the genesis behind that was. We pay them quarterly. We don't pay them monthly. So the first payment will go out in July. Got it. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. That was You're it. welcome. Okay, Mr. Murphy. Just a couple of questions. Why is unemployment uh, twice as much as what one twelfth would be? Um. So I I put that in my in my narrative. I based it on a hundred thousand dollars. That's what Mary was anticipating for the budget for twenty twenty one. Okay. And we haven't we haven't received any unemployment bills yet. Yep. Right. We're still, you know, we're we're kind of waiting for the shoe to drop to see how bad it's going to get. We haven't gotten one since the pandemic started. So I didn't wanna just base it on the fifty thousand. I figured it we would it would be smarter um to have some more money there because we have no idea what our bills are gonna look like. And what about the selectman? There are 4,100 higher than 112. Yeah, we put in a little bit of extra money. Um, I mean, I think that was that was partly to cover, you know, a, a couple weeks of salary for the new person. Um, okay. Just, you know, make sure we had a buffer. Yep. Then what's the story? about elections and registrations? Elections, Why? Why? I based on her 21 budget because she's got like two elections in it. Her 21 budget is... Yeah, but not in July. Not, not in July, but I, yeah. It won't be spent. Be the buffer I, anyway. I don't think any of that is going to be spent in elections in July. So I would suggest just dump, lowering that down. It, by, it doesn't matter, though. Well, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. She well, doesn't spend it. It you know it it just gets net off of what we actually vote at town meeting. Right, and and by the way, that that was one thing I wanted to point out that obviously the committee knows, but just to make it clear for anybody who may be listening, right? These it, it is a discussion I had with Sharon prior to the meeting. Um, the anything you know, we had this discussion at our meeting last week about okay, well, people get this one twelfth budget if they don't need it, what if they spend it, right? We're going to make sure, and this was the financial team discussed this, right? We're going to make sure that it is properly communicated to all the department heads and boards that the money you spend in July in the interim budget 
is dollar for dollar coming off your FY20. In other words, when the town passes an appropriation at town meeting for your budget, anything you spent in July is coming off, you know, gets deducted from that appropriation. This is not like a supplemental budget. So to the extent that you may get a funding level that's higher than you need in the month, if you choose as a department or board to spend that money in July, you're going to have less money for the rest of the year. I mean, that, that's just, it's a zero-sum game in that regard. And, and that's what we discussed, making sure that the departments understand that, that in the one twelve scenario, it is not a supplemental budget, it is a temporary budget that all monies expended in July under this temporary budget come off your appropriation that's approved by town meeting later in July. So, so, so to the extent that, you know, to, to Vin's question about elections, right, if hypothetically, you know, uh, uh, Liz went out and said, hey, you know, I've got this extra money, I'm gonna go buy, you know, do all this voting stuff, right? Then, then when she gets an approved budget by town meeting and they, they give her an appropriation, um, you know, the money she spent is comes right off the top of that. So she'd have to figure out how to deal with things elsewhere. So, Mr. Maxwell. So for the July town meeting, would we be voting a FY21 all-inclusive budget or yes. would we be subtracting? Yes. yes. Okay. We, we don't subtract. What I'm saying is to give you a hypothetical example, Let's say your one twelfth number. I'll pick round numbers. Let's say your one twelfth number is ten thousand dollars for the month of July, okay? But you only usually spend five thousand in July, but because of this requirement, you get a ten thousand allocation. Now, let's say your allocation for the year is sixty thousand. That's your FY twenty one budget, sixty thousand. Now you can go in and say, ordinarily, I do a five thousand run rate within the month of July, and then I'd be fine. If you then go below the ten thousand in July, you've only got fifty thousand to make it through the rest of FY twenty one. What town meeting approves is your total FY twenty one appropriation. And this money just comes. Anything you spend under this this plan comes off that comes out of that appropriation. Okay, thank you for clarifying. That's exactly why Sharon and I discussed making sure we clarify that so that people don't think that this is a supplemental budget. And then when town meeting approves a budget, that that's extra money on top of this. It's not. So. Okay. So yeah, I, I looked at it, and I think that I think that it's. You know, it's in good shape. We, we some of the exceptions. Obviously, if you look at some of the deltas. There are some big ones like the Keith Tech one, like the retirement and things. But we've already discussed those about how those are the one-off July expenses. So, uh, and to answer your question, Dan, um, I did verify with Mary from a liquidity perspective that there's no collections issue. And and you also have to remember that while we deferred, you know, the select board voted to defer the due date. It's now was due yesterday, right? So. So by the time this budget kicks in, you know, from a tax perspective, right, the payments were due yesterday for anybody who deferred from May. So, so there should not be a liquidity issue with this going forward. And, and last I talked to Mary, uh, the, the rate of collection was still at the levels we traditionally collect. Obviously, we don't get 100% in some titles. Some properties end up going into, you know, tax foreclosure or whatever. But she hasn't seen a drop off, and and to a large extent, that's because, as you know, a big chunk. And she told, I think, I don't know, I don't want to quote on the exact number, but I think she said something like eighty percent of the taxes that are paid quarterly are paid through the escrow companies, right? Yeah. So, so they all this deferral. Yeah, go ahead, Sharon. I was going to say, and majority of them, to my knowledge, all paid her on May first as usual. They did not defer their payments. So so in May, she, like you said, got 80% of her collections were done because the mortgage company sent it in. Yeah. So that's why I said I don't I don't foresee there being any liquidity issue with this. So okay. Do you have anything else for Sharon? So so I guess Sharon, the, the feedback for us from us is to correct that one budget. Already did. And I think that was it. Did, did you have anything else, Vin? I don't know if you your comments is, is well i would just suggest i realize it doesn't matter but just from a practical standpoint to lower that elections budget to the 112 minimum and rather than just base it off of the fy21 the rule was to base it off of fy20 so why add more than we don't we won't need yeah okay i can take that can take that feedback back to the select board and uh, we go from there okay okay 
So uh, that's it. Okay, so we're done with Sharon. So Sharon, you can go enjoy your your Tuesday evening. <laughs> we're slowly <laughs> plowing through all this. Okay. Um, okay. Now, as far as FY twenty one, I know we're we're getting late here, so I'm going to try to go a little quicker through the last few things. Um, as far as FY twenty one goes, Ben did send the updated sent me the updated spreadsheet I mentioned last week. He was making some changes to the budget spreadsheet. I put together a cut of the scenario Dan had put in the scenario planner with some minor modifications. I needed to confirm some numbers in there, and I'm going to get you know, Sharon and Mary wanted to look at that uh, to confirm some of the, you know, there may be newer information, right? I confirmed that the debt budget stays the same, things like that. But I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take what I have, send it to them for their kind of just quick check on, okay, do all the things like benefits and all that still align with what we know? Once they confirm those numbers, I will send it out to the whole committee, and then next week we'll have that discussion on that. That'll You'll see the way it's now formatted. It's a much easier discussion to say, okay, what are we going to do here? You know, it'll, you'll allow us to put together an FY21 blueprint pretty quickly. It'll, it'll start with one that I put in, but we'll be able to tweak things from there as we see fit uh, very easily. So, so we'll plan on having that discussion next week. Okay. Anybody have any comments on that? Okay. Um, okay. So, and and just from the from the other information perspective, you know, state, federal things. All of you have seen what's going on at the federal level. It's been made very clear from blocks of senators, especially, that uh, there is no desire to do anything from a stimulus perspective for state or local governments in the near term. Um, I think that at this point, and I'll get to you in a second, Dan, I think that at this point, the we know enough that we are going to have to proceed with a budget that looks at sharp local aid cuts, which is the scenario that Dan was, you know, scenarios like Dan was envisioning. Um, the one thing I will say about that is, as we have discussed, to date, the budgets we have been discussing, even under those scenarios, have not resulted in what I would call irreversible damage. And this is important because when you, if, you, if we were proposing a budget, for example, that cut you know, 50 employees, right? And then we get to October and the budget works out and the federal feds come through with some money and we sit there and we say, geez, we, we didn't need to pass such a, a, an aggressive budget and we, we really need those 50 people back, right? It's too late. But because we're putting together, even under this kind of worst case scenario, we're putting together right now, at least so far, a blueprint that does not reduce staff in any appreciable way or doesn't reduce it at all. Okay, um, That, in my mind, means we're good to go for town meeting because anything that happens, if we get good news between now and October, we can always improve things in October. But we're not, so we're not imposing damage in July that would be irreversible in October. So, so to me, that's the reason I'm pointing this out is because one of the discussions we had was do, the delay from June to July was because we said we have to make sure we want to wait for some information from the state, we want to wait for some information from the feds, get an idea as to where things are going. We have those ideas now, but now we've also come up with a spending plan that allows us to move forward even if we don't get definite data from the state. We see where the trend is very clearly. So. That's why I'm just pointing that out because I think we do want to, you know, emphasize strongly, and we'll talk about the the financial update message right in a minute. But that's why I put that paragraph in the draft that said we we, we believe that we're we should be going to town meeting now unless there's unless there's a compelling reason not to, and that's why I asked the chief if there's no if he doesn't perceive of a public safety issue in having town meeting, then we we should be having town meeting. Try. Okay, Mr. Alfred. Yeah, so basically what I wanted to say was sort of similar to what you had said. I mean, I know last night at the uh, the select board meeting was brought up uh, that uh, they were looking at, at, at holding, at the ability to hold town meeting is sort of a two-pronged approach, and it's from the, the health perspective, which we addressed earlier with the chief, and then as well from the financial perspective. And as you just said, you know, we have the information now that we know that we're not going to create any irreparable harm. Even if things are a little weaker than we built in, there's actually still some sort of cushion within the numbers that we're looking at a little bit if we were to take some some additional sort of ex extraordinary actions, but if we if it wasn't so bad, we could easily do deal with it. And if it ended up that the numbers ended up being much worse than we than, than we expect, we we will, we can easily get people ready for that and make those adjustments in, in October. 
but that certainly we're not going to be doing irreparable harm now. They can't, as you said, they cannot be sort of easily undone um, with October. It's it, in this case, in some ways, it, it's no, though we hate sort of those 9C cuts and the mid year cuts. First of all, October is not that far into the year that it, it would be any more, much more painful than it would in a in, in normal course that we could deal with for, with further cuts if we had to go that route. Um, but we're also certainly not going to be missing, uh, you know, people that we laid off unnecessarily because things came in better. So uh, in my mind, there's absolutely no reason right now that we can't put together a budget. Other towns are putting together a budget with what we know that the state has done a good job sort of telegraphing to us sort of where things are likely to, to be. We don't have exact numbers and because they don't really have exact numbers um, uh, yet because they're still pouring through things as, as, as the situation changes, but we, we have a pretty good idea. So. Um, there really isn't uh, any any barrier right now in my mind to, to holding at least some form of town meeting. And even if, if by July 20th of the we, we start going back up and spiking again, I would still say we'd look into those reduced quorum options to pass a budget, to get some capital done that we need to get done because there are things that are getting delayed beyond the point where they start to become, uh, you know, much more difficult to deal with later, so. Yeah. Okay, so any other comments on FY21? Yes, Sue. You're on, you're on mute, Sue. Sorry, thank you. Uh, just a clarification, Dan. When you said uh, dealing with capital, you mean the critical sort of capital spend items, right? Not uh, not things that would be continue to be discretionary to the extent that the economic situation isn't um, isn't doing well in October. Right. I don't mean we were going to just start going and, and going crazy on capital, but I just mean that I, I don't remember what's on the capital list right now. There's not actually a ton of it, but you know, it, any, anything that needs to be done. Needs oh, to be things done. things like the police radios, like right. the, the, the public safety issues, things like that. Correct. So things so, that would I mean, be I mean, considered and deemed critical spend, not discretionary spend. Yes. Or that we view to be important that we think we would do otherwise that that would need to get done over the summer or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, no, no. Makes right. sense. Okay. Right. And, then, and I was just going to point out, right? We we seem to, because of the delays, you know, people have seemed to seem to forgot in that in May in general, we don't do we do that kind of capital, the necessary capital, the summer capital, things that the school needs before the school year starts, and we do everything else in October. So so it's not like we we sit in May and say let's just spend all our capital money, right? We usually don't do that anyway. So. Okay, anybody have any other commentary about FY21? Okay, let's move on. So, so I sent out the financial update document. As I said, when I sent the email to everybody, I had been thinking about this because, you know, we usually have the opportunity in, in May town meeting to kind of the town an update. And I felt that with town meeting now being to July, obviously we'll give them an update in July, um, but, but the pandemic's now been going on for, you know, two plus months, three months, whatever. And, you know, anybody who's observing what's happening around us may have been, been asking the obvious question, you know, what's happening here? What, you know, what is, the, what is our situation? And because we didn't have our town meeting, I felt maybe we should just write something, you know, write something up. So I knew, you know, I drafted that, that uh, uh, communication to basically put out in, in essence as a press release, you know, send it to HR or post it on Facebook or something and just say, it's just an update for the town in case they're wondering what the pandemic is doing to our finances. So did everybody get a chance to read it? And if so, you know, what, uh, what kind of feedback uh, do, we, do we have on it? So, so I think it's a, if I, I'm sorry, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a really good letter goes into a lot of detail. I think it'll be helpful for the town to sort of know what we're doing. Um, it um, was very even keeled. I think the, the, I just had a couple of things in, in the one, two, in the third paragraph, you say second, we revise our, our I just uh, we revise our budget guideline for fiscal year 21 to reflect no increase over fiscal year 20, and ask all boards to, and department heads to scrutinize their budgets carefully in preparation for budget cuts if the if the situation worsens. I just wonder if there's a better way of saying that sort of thing. We we took the interim step of going to a, a you know a zero percent and you know with it, some, something like that, um, and, and you know though and 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 inform people that you know this this is where we hoped. To go no further then but to some but that you know but to be prepared you know if we had to go further that, that we weren't sort of ruling that out at the time okay um it's, so it's minor so, it's just it, you, you do kind of essentially say that i just don't know if there's a way of more clearly saying it uh well i could just say in preparation for further i don't want to say further cuts because it's not cuts we didn't cut anything we're, we're right. level funding right that's why 
I, I said preparation for budget cuts, not further cuts, because that implies that we were cutting budgets, which we aren't doing. Well, I mean, right. No, I don't want to say that, but I just, you know, it's sort of that we, we revised our budget guidance for, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to down to, to 0% growth. Um, okay. To reflect a zero, what could you show? Do you want me to just say 0% increase or do you have no growth over it? I don't know. No, I mean, it kind of, I mean, it, it, you say it, I just, I don't know. It just, it felt like it sort of, <laughs> I don't know. See, it, see, it, it, see the, the way I, the way I see it is I'm fine with whatever correction you want to make, but you got to tell me what you want the correction. No, I know. And I don't know how I, I kind of just underlined it in my, in my notes and it didn't really, because I couldn't come up with a better way. So let's just leave it. You know, if no, if, if, if I mean, everyone understands that basically we, we revised it down to zero and said, Hey, this is where we hope to, to stay, but just in case plan for, you know, having to start thinking in your head in case we need, do need to go worse, which we luckily yeah. to, this, to this point haven't had to do that. Yes, yes, Ben. Maybe um, what I was thinking you could say is you could say to, to Dan's point, um, asked all town boards and department heads to scrutinize their budgets carefully for potential budget cuts if the, if the situation worsened. Does that sound better, Dan? Yeah, because I think preparation makes it sound yeah. like they're going to have budget cuts, but potential yeah. cuts, they could go either way. Yeah. Okay. I just want to also take the opportunity to say, you know, there are, you know, it is incredible how how flexible it is. It is seems that our that our budget has been able to sort of with the with the reserves that we, you know, the, you know, the, the the way we've done building up stabilization. Uh, you know, Brookline laid off a whole bunch of. Uh, employees uh, recently, I know a whole bunch of teachers um, and uh, other towns. You know, Natick has already done it. I mean, there's a, there's a slew of towns that are that are already going through layoffs, and you know, the fact that we really haven't haven't had any any of those in in Halston and you know, certainly not for sort of the main operate. You know, in the mm -hmm. in the main area is just a real sort of testament to sort of um, everyone has done. Anyway, uh, in the second in the next paragraph, the only thing I have to add is just a comment about how. The, the, you know that uh, the, the somewhere um, that the federal government uh, you know seems locked in, in, in a political stalemate, and that uh, you know we, we don't believe that there's any any sort of you know any you know uh, it, it, we're we're not we don't that you know we don't think that they're going to be a, a substantial source of of, of of funding to to help sort of cover the the, the gap, and if they are, it'll certainly be much later in the year. Okay, uh, so what I could, what I would suggest if, if, well, first of all, does everybody want to add a statement like that? If so, I can add a statement after what I would suggest is do it after that. The statement I have, it says about GDP shrinking and unprecedented rates say uh, the federal government uh, uh, is showing no signs of further action, of, of, of further action to help uh, municipal governments. We do not anticipate any assistance from the federal government at this time. Not possible action, because obviously, the, or, or sort of, you know, the House passed a law, a bill, but it has no right. chance of becoming law. So not passable, sort of, a, you know. Um, okay. Well, well it, you know, we're, we're planning with the assumption that no federal assistance will come. So if it comes, it's, hey, bonus, instead of but we're also, anticipating it, we're planning based on it. Any that does right. come, I think, will, will help, but will not be a savior. Will not will not sort of cure all right, all but we're not planning for it. Right. We're basically pretending we're 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 assuming that it's not coming. So if it does come, it's helpful, and it's not. We're yep. holding out hope that it's coming to to save us. Yep. Okay. So how do we want to phrase this? I guess that's the question. So we say well, my my suggestion is is that you know we we do not anticipate any assistance from the federal government at this time. Any further assistance, right? Because. True. Oh, yeah, has been yeah some. further because we did get the the CARES Act. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, let me think about that. Uh, I'm trying to think of where I want to put that. Um, okay, I'll put that. If, if we're going to say that, then I'll put that after the shortfall of approximately six billion. Then say we do not anticipate any further assistance from the federal government. Yeah, I think that's a better place. Okay. Uh, just okay. It's always funny. Every time you type at this time in a 
Word document, it wants to change it to currently, but that's not always the way you want to descend. You know, that's not always the right word. So, okay, so uh, anything else? Yes, I'm wondering if you should okay. move your paragraph then. Which one? I know. Regarding well, whoever's watching. Um, from the town meeting, how we've built up the reserves. If there's any positive economic disaster in this unfolding, or is that blah, 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 yeah. move it up. Because you're kind of like burying the lead that we're in a better position than other towns. And we should pat ourselves on the back that this town has been had the foresight to do all this stuff. At least that's what I would suggest. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I don't know how I feel about that. And I'll, let's, I'll see. The only reason I say it is because it's, it's, I, I, I don't want, while yes, it's, we want to, in, in a sense, pat ourselves on the back by saying, look, we, we've taken steps that are now, yep. you know, paying dividends, right? The, the, the reason I ordered it the way I did was because I wanted to summarize, this is what the scenario looks like, right? GDP shrinking, revenue shrinking, towns around us are laying out things. Here's, here's the positive. We, we are watching this unfold, but we're in better shape than, than what you're seeing. You don't and, mention other towns. Maybe you should. I do. In the paragraph above that, I said that oh. uh, I said towns all around us have been laying off or furloughing employees as they deal with the impact of current revenue shortfalls and the bleak outlook for the next fiscal year. Okay. Yep. Now I see. And that's why I said I was kind of doing it in a, a structured way of here's all the bad news, right? This is what's out there. So you know what's out there. And the good news is, guess what? We we were prepared for this better than most people. And then we then I go into the whole thing so about uh, just, put head headlines or titles like so people people are lazy and if we don't bullet things do, put, do i put an executive summary at the top says one bullet well you know, like just things are not as bad here as they could yeah be. i don't know i'm just wondering is just knowing people are going to look at all this i can see hr Allison reporter kind of summarizing this and no, this, is, this is a press release they, this is going to be a press release right i'm not i'm going to send it to them as a press release so it'd be okay. printed as it is okay so I think it's great, but Vin is right. I mean, so I think it's fantastic, and we don't have to change. You know, we don't have to change the length, but um, some, some. I don't know that everybody will read the whole thing. Oh, I know that most people won't, but it's just like town meeting, right? We we have three hundred people in the town that pay attention to the finances in general. My my intent with a lot of this was the two twofold purpose. One is for those three hundred people. They're the ones that will read it because they'll see it and they'll say, okay, what's the story? Because they're going to show up on July 20th and want to have a clue. Yeah. There's a lot going on and it takes words to cover them. Yeah, I don't yeah. disagree. I, th I, I think I, I emailed Ken earlier. I thought it was a fantastic idea. So I'm very much in line. Um, so, and so, I don't know that you can shorten it either. Like, I don't know. I wouldn't know <laughs> to cut out. So I thought it was really good. I well, just, well the, other, the, the other aspect of it is I, I really did when I was writing it, I was mindful of, okay, I don't want to write a, you know, war and peace about our town's finances. Right. Yeah. But, but at the same time, I, I sat there and said, it's important to put this out there, even if nobody reads it. Right. Because, you know, I mean, some people will read the whole thing yeah. that care, but, but even if they don't write away, right. Then it's something where somebody may read something and have a question. And they, and so they may know some, one of the 300 people who read it and they say, Oh yeah, this is where it is. Or there, they can convey that information to other people that talk to them and say, "Oh, you know what the hell's going on here, right? Oh, there's this thing." So, so I kind of looked at it as like lay it out for the people that are going to read it all, and the people that aren't going to read it are not going to read it, right? I could write one paragraph; they're not going to read it. Yes. You know, th those people. The only way we're going to get to them is have, as I said, like an executive summary of one bullet that says, "Things suck. We're not that bad." <laughs> and, and it's like, and I don't think that serves much of a purpose. You know? No, it's good, and, and they can use it too to refresh before town meeting as well, just to you know sort of say, okay, how, what was the process? So I, 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 yeah, I think it's great. And by the way, Sue, just so you know, I made the little minor tweaks that you suggested. Oh, yeah, thank you. Just a couple it of words. Wasn't much. Mm. So, any other feedback? Okay, if not, then I'll entertain a motion to approve the. Uh, what do you want to call it? Press release. As motion to approve press release. the press release as amended for release and publication on all forms of social media that, that, that Donald Trump has outlawed and Hollis and Edward. That's right. No, but no, motion Second. to approve this press release for release. Second. Okay. Any further discussion on that motion? Okay, let's proceed to a vote. Mr. Sparrow? Aye. Ms. Zemer? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Alfred? Uh, Ms. Nersessian? Yes. 
Mr. Maxwell. Yes. Okay, and I vote yes, so that's unanimous. Okay, I will. I will. You know, I have the corrections. I'll just. I'll send out the updated, corrected version when I send it out, and I'll pass along. I don't know if you know if I'll send it to HR. I don't know if uh, what our for since we don't usually do press releases. I don't know. You know, just do somebody like Dan or Michelle. Do you want to post it on Facebook or something like that? Sure. And, you know, handle this. Hopefully, 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 HR will post it, then we can can update the links. Uh, on oh, that's true. Yep. Uh, that would be the cleanest and easiest way to do it. But um, if for some reason they don't want to post it, then we'll. Yeah. Isn't well, there I, a Tyler I, I, Holliston I, Facebook page? Because mm -hmm. maybe Chief Cassidy could help post it there. Right. We, we've got both Facebook as well as the um, the website. Okay. So there you go. So I'll, I'll send it to you, uh, Chief, when, when, it's, when I have the final little edits here. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So let's see. Next up on the agenda. Uh, was a uh, warrant articles for town meeting. Now, now the question I have for this is we did get a new draft. I had a conversation with Jeff before at the finance team meeting and it was, um, uh, I said to him, has the select board reviewed all these articles and finalized the warrant, right? Because, and the answer is no. So, you know, he kind of said to me, I keep giving them changes. Now, I'm, 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 I don't want to throw Jeff under the bus, but I'm just saying that the impression he gave me was he's been giving them these changes and they have not yet acted on it. And he's actually, you know, wondering what the story is in terms of, okay, are they going to finalize a warrant? Are they going to make, you know, so he was kind of saying to me, yeah, I'm giving you these changes, but the select board has not yet approved a lot of them. So, so I don't know what we want to do. Um, there is one I'll get to, but I want to give Mr. Mr. Alfred, you, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, the only one I want to talk about, maybe this is the one that you were mentioning, was, was four and five, which they had uh, they had discussed briefly last night. They hadn't taken any action on it. Um, I think Sharon left, but uh, I, I know that she was of the opinion that they should remain separate for just an ease. Uh, I think th this is the- This, this is, is the town, this is Liz, the thing the about- town the, the, town, the town clerk's uh, salary adjustment that needs to be voted on. I'm of the strong opinion that we should keep them separate. I, I know that there was a discussion because we are trying to keep the number of articles down uh, for for brevity in, in, in the era of social distancing and, and, and being in close or contact with people. Uh, but I actually think combining them will actually uh, lengthen the, the discussion about the article and that uh, you know two uh, separate ones will, will you'll, you'll end up basically debating if, if there is a significant amount of debate, you'll end up debating uh, both of them at the same time, kind of in, in conjunction, and then just have them separate, separate votes, um, and and that also makes it cleaner. And as far as the you know ongoing sort of ongoing salary, and I don't you know I know there's some debate about how how it's paid out, and that, to me that's not even sort of really what, what I'm interested in. But if it makes it easier to sort of pay out, that's fine. Um, I just think that you know by trying to squash everything together, I think it confuses the issue and will only sort of uh, prolong the the, uh, the the debate and discussion, and then so you'll actually by trying to combine them actually make things longer in time. So I'm strongly in the opinion that they should be two separate articles, um, and uh, so that we can also take two separate votes on them. Okay. Um, well, I, I will say that I, I agree, and there was one thing that I thought about uh, when I was having a discussion earlier today with Mr. Sparrow was, uh, you know, one of the other side effects. Th there are lots of, in my mind potential pitfalls, right? Um, and just to give you an example, one would be if you jack up the, sa the salary temporarily, um, that's not a, you know, this, this idea of overpaying for one year basically to make up for the last year, that has pension implications, right? That makes that, you know, if, if Liz were to retire, and this is not unique to Liz, I'm saying any town clerk were in that position, and, you know, she retired at the end of next year, that changes her pension calculation because now, now you could argue, well, she got paid less the year before and maybe it's a wash, I don't know, but they take your three highest years, things like this. So they could distort that, which means that over the pension calculation, you're, you're paying some additional amount. But also there are other things like what happens if, you know, she decides uh, she resigns in the middle of the year, right? Is, is she owed the remainder of the money? You know, if it was stated by a town meeting that this was paid payment for, you know, retroactive pay, you know, how does that work? Because technically she'd resign, she'd stop getting paid, and then would she then be able to go back and say, now give me the rest of it? You know, I mean, there, there are, I, I don't know legally, I'm not going to pretend to be a lawyer, but I know that with contracts, we have definitely done retroactive pay before, 
right? We, we now, now maybe the town clerk is different because it's an elected position. I have no idea. As I said, I'm not a lawyer, but I really do think that we need to carefully consider uh, that whole concept of of kind of like the overpay for FY21 to make up for FY21. I was just saying, town council told them they could told told the select board that they could put them together, but he did not say that they shouldn't keep them apart or couldn't keep them apart. And so I think just because you can do something doesn't make it the right way to do it. So right. I, I, I don't, the whole town council said this is one way to do it, is the way to do it. That that to me is is a red herring that doesn't matter because it's not like the town council told you you couldn't have two separate articles. Right. Okay. I have to but, disagree with Dan because I didn't think that's what he said when I listened to it. Um, I thought the town council said you needed to put them into one article. It was a confusion in the way it was being presented under two articles, and it had to be put in as FY21 pay. Now, we need to break it out and clarify, yeah, this is what it is, portion it is, and I don't know, we can look discuss how the wording is on the below, but I don't think, from what I recall, and now it's been a couple of weeks, but the town council was saying it needed to be... I think he was talking about how it was paid. I think he was talking about how it was paid, not how it was derived. For instance, within the police department budget, there are like 15 different line items that all go to pay the police officers for different for different things, right? We, we break out police officers' pay all the time. When they get the paycheck, it may be all lumped together. I don't know how you know it looks, but things are broken out all the time for, for, for different ways of, of, of pay, you know, based upon, you know, different items. For instance, in all the budgets, actually, that we have, um, um, what is it called? Um, uh, you know, long-term employee, what, what is it? The, the longevity. Longevity pay, that's a the separate line item, and we vote on separate line items all the time. So, I, I mean, I don't, I, I think that his concern, I don't, I don't, I, I wasn't there when I heard it, but just based upon sort of what the conversation that we were having last night, I think the the concern was how it ended up being paid out, if it could be paid out as one lump sum or not, and there was some, some, some issues there. That, that's, I'm not talking about that at all. That, that, that's up to sort of the back end, sort of the systems and, and how things are, are dealt with, uh, you know, um yeah. later but but yeah, that, I, there's, there's no reason that they couldn't have two separate articles right and that and it's possible it's possible that that the i i didn't see the discussion so i don't want to make too much analysis on it but it's possible that they may have there may have been some confusion about the concept because i think the article the separate article as written was something like supplementing fy20 pay True. And maybe the town council said, hey, if it's being paid out after July 1, it can't be, you know, because town meeting did not approve it in FY20, it can't, right? But, yeah. but, no, I even so, right. but even so, if that's the case, you could have two articles that said, here's the base pay, and for FY21, here's the supplemental pay for this, this amount. And, and at least from the town's perspective, you say, this is what the salary is going to be. And that article, other article makes it clear that it's a one-year only supplemental pay. And then I, I think just from the, the, the clarity point of view, it becomes much easier to explain to the town and say, this, you don't have to take any action next year to undo this because you're, you're saying this is the salary going forward. So, Mr. Sparrow. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I want to, I mean, I, you know, I have some opinions about this, but the select board hasn't officially taken any of this under consideration so we don't even know what they're going to do if they're going to do one article or two yet so i think this you know this conversation is interesting but it's premature. we're gonna have to have it again anyway yeah. it's just premature that's all fair enough ben but just because they were having this sort of debate last night i just wanted to sort of get my opinion on, on the record so they can take that for what it is um but and just sort of state our my rationale anyway, yeah. okay cool. michelle you had a comment I just think it's much cleaner to have it as two articles. Okay. Okay. Well, well as I said, I think Ben's right. We'll, we'll wait and see what they decide. But I think that, that the feedback from us is pretty clear that we think it's better structured as two. So, uh, okay. Any uh, Anything else on the Warren? As I said, I don't think there's much point. And the one thing I did want to point out with regards to the Warren, if you looked at the draft, there's an article on there about the um, the surcharge to pay for the sustainability coordinator. Okay, on the electric bills, the point one, whatever it is, the amount. And I did, you know, I did, uh, I was contacted by some of the, the group, the Upper Charles Action Group that, that had gotten the sustainability coordinator thing rolling. And they had expressed some concern about, uh, you know, they had heard that we were, I wasn't in favor of something like this. I just wanted to state for the record, just to be clear, I have talked to Mr. Cronin about that when we 
talked on the phone last week and I said to him, the only thing that, you know, I think we all seven of us have said in open session, right? We recognize that the sustainability coordinator is a, an important function. The climate change issue is a serious issue. Um, the issue that I raised with Mr. Cronin wasn't that I was opposed to the sustainability coordinator. It was that I was concerned that it had been presented to the town as a self-funding position. Okay. And I said to him, I understand maybe the circumstances have changed and we now need to go to the town and say, Hey, you know, but, but that was my concern was, was, Hey, you know, it's, it's, and I hate to use this analogy, but this is the analogy I used not with Mr. Cronin, but with one of the members of the group where I said, it's like the Trump wall where he says, you know, I'm going to build this wall and Mexico's going to pay for it. And then, Oh, guess what? You're paying for it. Right. So I had, and I, and the reason I had discussed with Mr. Cronin was not just that I, I had mentioned it primarily because I felt that we were going to want to, you know, as a committee, I know I personally wanted more information in terms of how does this work from a surcharge perspective? Is it just people that are on the municipal aggregation program that pays this charge? Is it every electric bill? How is the money collected? Where does it go into the general fund to fund this position? You know, how much money is expected to rate, right? So I was just kind of giving him the early feedback of, I saw this article and you're going to need to give us, you know, the select board is going to need to provide us with more information to make a decision about this, this position. It's not that in any way saying we, we are or not. And I pointed that out to them. I said, we're not taking a vote on this. We haven't gotten the information. I just merely said to Mr. Cronin, this is my concern that we told it to the town as a self-funding position. So, so uh, I just want to make that clear in case they're watching or listening and just understand that, that we as a committee have not had any discussion about that article yet. So, Mr. Alfred. Uh, Sue is first, I'll let her go. Okay, go ahead, Sue. Yeah, I was just going to, I would echo what you said, Ken. I was um, very concerned to see it in the warrant. Um, and in going back through the minutes that Vin had recently sent out, it was clear in the minutes that this was going to be self-funding. I would like to very much understand what happened mm -hmm. uh, and why, you know, a mere, you know, few months later, um, there was no plan and there, there should have been some plan as they sort of actioned into the role and figured this out because that's exactly the way it was sold to the town. And I'm really concerned that we're now going to try to push it down to the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. so, Mr. Albert. Yeah. So, I mean, basically I, I think that, yeah, we were sold, uh, the, this whole position as a, as a self-funding, uh, funded mechanism. I, I get things have changed, but uh, I was worried about this at the beginning because we, we tend to do this in town a lot. There have been other instances and I don't need to go into the, the details of those. Um, but I will say that for the record that I, I am, am, if, it, if it's on the warrant, I, I will vote against this. I think that, you know, in the, in these, you know, circumstances and time, economic times, this is a, a sort of hidden backdoor tax uh, on, on the, the, the taxpayers of Holliston and the, the, the homeowners and renters in, in, in Holliston. And um, this is just not something that I think that, uh, you know, given that we were told that this was going to be self-funding to, to switch right away and, and do a, a tax increase like this is, is, is just, uh, you know, I would, I would rather put the, you know, put the position on hold and, and try to figure out a, a long-term, you know, sustainable funding mechanism that, that, that they can sort of self-fund through. Um, because again, we were, you know, this, this position was told that they were going to bring in revenue. And at the, 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 the select board meeting, they started talking about the fact that all the things that they were doing that had nothing to do with bringing in revenue. They basically spent the entire time getting sort of started up to speed and everything when we were told, oh, they, they've got tons of things to do right away that they can start bringing in revenue. Right. So, and, and just to be clear, on the revenue side, it's not so much bringing in revenue, it's either bringing in revenue or reduced costs, right? In other words, we either sure, get sure. grants or we become more energy efficient. But, getting, but writing grants, winning grants, you know, saving the town money through through the right. implementation of whatever the grant is, if, it, if the grant is for light bulbs that then reduce the, you know, the cost of electricity for town, things like that. Uh, but but there's, there's been none of that, and clearly there isn't because they're now looking for alternative funding sources. So, um, you know. Well, do you think it would be helpful, since we're gonna have to debate this article at some point, because it's obviously not gonna go away. That's one I don't expect to go away. If, if you think it would be helpful, I could ask the sustainability coordinator to come to one of our meetings and update us on Kind of give us the scoop like what is this why you know are we not getting grants are there you know what what is what are the what is the plan because i i do think that if it's a temporary issue like let's say the guy said oh i submitted five grants to these different programs 
but it's there's a six month lag between the grant funding and the approval. And I just need to get by for the, you know, till we see. And then once I get these grants, it becomes right. Then you, we could look at different ways other than a surcharge, right? The problem with the surcharge is it's going to be forever. So right. I'd much rather look at can we bridge this funding? If there's a problem with a gap, let's look at can we bridge it and then get it to the self funding state. Sure. If you can, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's worth the time. Because if you can say, look, I've written these grants and this is what's going to come in and this will be the revenue and the savings. And it's just that, you know, it, it takes time to get that, those up to speed, but I have done that, the work, you know, a bridge, you know, could be certainly something that we're, we could, we could, I would be willing to, 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 to entertain, but, but the, the rate hike is, is, is really yeah. just, just sort of, especially in this economic environment, just, just, just sort of rubs me the wrong way. Oh yeah. Okay, Michelle. You said exactly what I was going to say. If there's some kind of lag, I'd rather fund a position and put on a surcharge that's going to be there forever. That's exactly what I was going to say. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, as I said, I, I just the reason I want to bring it up was because I wanted to ask that specific question. Do you want me to bring in a sustainability coordinator? And it sounds like the answer is yes. So I'll I'll reach out and uh, try to get him to. Uh, come in and talk about what's going on and, and what the plan is to get to self self sustaining if uh, if we're not there yet. Okay. Anything else on the warrant draft as I said if unless there's something specific we can defer that because we still don't have a final official warrant. Um, okay. Uh, last thing uh, and I will say right from the beginning uh, I want to keep this discussion very short but I do want to give anybody an opportunity as as some of you may or may not be aware uh, we were on the agenda for last Thursday's select board meeting um, because the uh, select board put an agenda item on there that I personally take great offense to because the agenda item said open meeting law violation by the finance committee on May 5th. And the last I checked uh, with my legal background, which is not much, but I have many of lawyer friends. Uh, every time you turn on the TV and they talk about somebody allegedly committing a crime, it's because it's considered inappropriate to state that they have committed the crime prior to any determination of conviction. Uh, in this particular case, the select board chose to add an agenda item clearly in their mind or in, in whoever put the agenda together's mind, indicating that we had violated the open meeting law when in fact no complaint had been filed, no determination had been made. And in fact, based on the discussion and advice of town council, uh, no violation had occurred. So, uh, which they knew before the meeting. Yes, uh, yes, which they knew before the meeting. So, so for me personally, I don't want to turn this into. This is not going to turn into a half-hour rant against the select board. I don't want that. But I just wanted to a point that out for the record that there was no violation and there was there never has been a determination. So that agenda item was very misleading. Um, to some of, I know, I know a couple of you were on that call. I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to either you know, give us the summary of what occurred or comments on what occurred and give the rest of the members an opportunity to essentially just uh, you know, uh, present or, or say whatever they wanted to say about that. But I, as I said, I'm not gonna let this degrade into a half hour discussion about uh, them versus us. So, okay, so Mr. Sparrow. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I was on that call. Um, I, I listened. I didn't, I didn't have a lot to say. Um, but um, basically what the select board um, indicated was what you said is that it was brought up as an agenda item. Um, they felt that it was, um, uh, that there was information um, that there, there was not a reasonable cause to uh, file an open meeting law. Uh, complaint against us because it was on our agenda and the warrant um, that we received several days prior um, right. included these transfers in the, um, uh, in the warrant that was sent out to us to be discussed. Um, so there was, you know, there was a lot of other stuff that you know, uh, John uh, detailed the a lot of his perspective on what happened and how we got to where we are. Um, and then uh, Dan uh, stood, stepped forward and he can speak for himself, but he stepped forward and spoke um, um, passionately about um, in defense of the finance committee. Um, my only comment was I'm done with this. I don't want to talk about this anymore. And I'm still reiterating that I'm kind of 
sick of this um, and I don't want to talk about it anymore. So yeah. that's all I want to say. Okay, uh, Mr. Alfred, you had your hand up. I actually didn't, but um, oh, uh, did, oh, did I thought you did before. Have any co comments? I mean, I can. I mean, look. At the end of the day, what what um, happened uh, last week uh, was a, a a political hit job uh, by the the select board. They knew going into that meeting that uh, they were not going to go forward with a a um, open meeting law violation, um, you know, um, inquiry or, or whatever. Um, furthermore, I thought the fact that they had decided to make this a formal board um, discussion and decision uh, elevated it to a, a whole new different level uh, that, you know, rather than, than file a complaint as an individual um, or even as, in, as individuals, the fact that they were bringing this up, it was brought up in, in, for the sole purpose of trying to embarrass us and make us look bad, which given the fact that going into it they knew that there was actual no violation i i, I think went okay. went the other way so I, i'm just going to say that you know i i it was it, it was a really a big waste of of uh, time i don't think the debate on the subject matter is necessarily over uh and we will we will certainly debate that when when the proper time comes but um i, I was very very disappointed anybody have any other comments Okay, the, the only last thing that I would say, oh, Sue, go ahead. I, I just have a question. Does anything, um, I, I would agree with you on the, um, the, fa the, the agenda being presented the way that it was, um, was misleading and does that need to be fixed? Uh, in the ideal world, yes. I, as a practical matter, I have no idea how you would retroactively correct an agenda. I mean, I brought it up at the meeting. I mean, I, yeah. I mentioned well, it. Well, the, the, other, the, the other thing is, as a practical matter, right, if somebody were to go back in history years from now and look at that, find that agenda and say, oh, what's this violation? They would look for one on the AG's website and not find anything, right? And if they look up the meeting minutes, they'd see that there was no filing. And so, so while I agree and I, you know, feel it's, it, it's definitely was an inappropriate agenda item, um, you know, I don't know what, what, recourse we have and maybe michelle you raise your hand you're the lawyer in the team so i would, would go ahead and comment on that is she frozen yeah she's frozen oh, there you go. we seriously need to get get <laughs> michelle off her ipad her wireless is terrible yeah everyone um that something that came up last so um represents the select board and the town administrator doesn't represent us and he doesn't represent town meeting and that's an important distinction to remember um and he was given a charge by the select board and he carried that out um what the select board did wasn't illegal we considered it a loophole but what they did was perfectly legal which we um, which we did state by the way at the meeting in question we did say it wasn't illegal, but we've considered it a loophole. We've been very clear that they did not do anything illegal, but it was, but that doesn't mean what they did was right. That's correct. Right. That's, that's correct. We, we felt, I, I'm speaking for me, I felt it was something that should have gone to town meeting ethically and morally, but legally what they did was legal. Right. And that's what we should remember. Right. And, that, and that's why I said, just to be clear for anybody who might not know about the exchange, at the meeting in question, that was stated. That's in, it's in the record, it's in the minutes. I looked in the draft minutes. Right. It says very clearly that nobody said that they did anything illegal, nobody said it, but there's a very big distinction, and I think you know all of us know that, between meeting the letter of the law and, and breaking the law and doing something that we consider to be the right thing to do. That's it, and that's all I'm gonna say about that. But the other thing I did wanna point out just because this just because this kind of popped up, I, I had a discussion about this and I said, look, you know, the funny thing was the discussion was about the Warren article. But if you recall, the entire discussion started because of a line item transfer, because I was informing, I said to the committee, I just wanted to let everybody know this line item transfer we expected to see was not going to be coming, as you saw Mr. Tallerman's opinion, because it was no longer needed. And one of the comments that I, I thought was particularly insightful when I went through and looked at some of that somebody sent me uh, some of the clips from the meeting last Thursday 
was Mr. Cronin saying, I don't know why this was brought up. And so just for the record, I did want to point this out. If you look at our minutes, which we will approve next week for April 28th, actually we approved them tonight, the April 28th minutes, right? In those minutes, there is a line there, which I knew to be true, that uh, Mr. Cronin informed the committee that the select board is planning on doing a line item transfer for the department head salary adjustments that were omitted from the warrant of the October 2020 town meeting, okay? The reason I'm pointing that out is because when he made the statement that I don't know why these, they, this was brought up at the FinCom meeting, that was why I was informing the committee that we were no longer getting the transfer that he himself had stated to us was coming. So because we expressed just to be clear. Because at that meeting, we expressed reservations about those transfers. Yes, and, and so that, they we'll looked, go down that road. But, 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 but that, was the, that was the genesis of them not bringing the transfers to us. Yes. Had nobody said there was any problem with it, they would have brought the transfers to us and we would have gone forward with the transfers. Anyway, I don't I don't know if there's anyone from yeah. the, the select board on that maybe want, wants to say anything. I know that they always seem, uh, you know. I don't think so, but uh, I don't see any requests. Usually somebody will make it, I'll see the hands up or something like that or a request somewhere. But, um, but yeah, but as I said, I don't wanna spend any more time on this. I just wanted to straighten out for the record that there was no violation and that we were talking about a transfer that we were told to expect. So, so the idea of not being able to cover it on our agenda when it, it actually is covered by three different items on the agenda that night, line item transfers, the warrant, and, and FY21, and FY20, you know, FY21 uh, budget stuff, because this was discussed. Right. But anyway, if I, could just say I, one, I am concerned about the agenda. I'm sorry. Thing. I'm concerned. I'm concerned about that too. I just one of the things, or one on on this topic, the the select board a number of times has has expressed sort of exasperation with us and the sort of our working relationship with them, and wanting to make you know wanting to to find a way to get to a, a place where we had a better working relationship. I just want to point out that this is not the way to do it. I, I don't know how else to say that, but if if the goal is That's to get fine. a better working relationship with us, that was not it. Well, I will just say, I don't, I don't take any, with all these things, right, we are elected to do a job, and we do our job. And that's, if in the course of doing that job, some people disagree with our recommendations, that's okay. Um, we have a charge to make recommendations to the town. The town doesn't have to listen to us at any given recommendation we make. Okay. So, so while I, I'm just saying that I don't look at it and say I have a problem cooperating with the select board, we're doing our job, they're doing theirs. We're the balances and checks. They can ask for any board, not just the select board. Every board, every department presents us with a budget. We have an obligation to make a recommendation on that budget. If we don't agree with what they ask for, we recommend something different, and it's up to the town to decide. The town is the authority. That's why town meeting, just separate from this discussion, that's why town meeting is so important. Because right. town meeting is the appropriate authority of the town, not the select board, not the finance committee. But this isn't about a disagreement. We can have a disagreement. We can disagree, and we can move forward. But this was was you know was bringing trumped up charges in front of the town to knowing them to be false. Okay. And, yes. And that point is taken. Not conducive to to helping our working relationship. Okay. Okay. Let's move forward. Michelle, you had something to say. I just we'll wanted a clarification from Sue. You said the agenda. Did you mean our May fifth agenda, or no, 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 no? Board. I mean the select board's agenda. I'm really concerned with the language that they put in there, um, and that it is entirely incorrect, given the circumstances. I, I frankly am very troubled by that, and um, I don't know. I know Michelle, I, I, you cut out on me a little bit when you started speaking earlier. I, I think you said that. Town council isn't really town council, it's select board council. No, well, that's what town council said. Town council said his responsibility is to the select board. Because that was the question that was asked was, is he representing the town or is he right. representing the select board when the interests are different? So and do he, we have a town council then? Like who represents well, well, the town? Th that's separate from this issue, just to be clear. This is separate from the whole dis the issue from last Thursday, but it does raise. In my mind, when I heard that, it did raise one uh, concern, which was, you know, that that does change things in one sense, which is if we're going to town council for advice and the client is the select board, there are two things that happen, one of which already happened to me, right? I had sort of sent a communication to Jay after he sent me an email that he then handed to the select board. Now, I don't care because it wasn't like I was trying to hide it from them, but it surprised me because I sat there and said, 
you know, this is as a client matter. I'm talking to an attorney. It's not usual practice for an attorney to turn around and send it to someone else, right? So that's okay. Again, I'm not accusing or insinuating anything bad on Jay. I'm just saying that it now makes sense that he did that because he's looking at it saying, my client is the select board. So if somebody communicates with me concerning the town, it goes to the select board. And that may be okay. But but it does raise the question from, from our board and from any other board's perspective of if, if that is what the quote unquote town council is charged with doing, being the attorney to the select board only, right? Does that mean that in a dispute situation that other boards would have to retain their own counsel. And that's the reason I ask that is because that's a financial question, right? We've always known the school committee has their own counsel because they deal with negotiations and things like that. So they've always, but, but I really don't want to go down the road of saying, okay, well, if we have a dispute about something with the FinCom or, I mean, with the select board, or if the assessors have some dispute with the select board, that the assessors then have to send us a bill for a lawyer that they had to hire to, to get an opinion versus the town council really being quote unquote the town council and saying okay if the assessors go and say we think this and the select board says we think this that 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 town council just opines on the law in other words doesn't say okay you know, you're right or you're wrong but says hey this is what the law says that this is one responsibility this you know and again i'm not trying to be a lawyer but i always looked at town council as kind of that that he was the he or she was the advisor to what the law says and then the town the parties involved once seeing that interpretation or that that understanding of the law, the differences are usually resolved. If, if the, for example, the select board was trying to overstep their authority or the school committee was trying to overstep theirs, that you would go to town council, town council would say, here are the statutes and, and give you the legal basis to say, okay, statute A says, you know, this is school committee authority, statute B says this is select board, right? And then both sides would look at it and say, okay, so yeah, the statute's clear, it's your authority, it's not ours or whatever. And that, so it does have, to me, financial implications. And I, I would like to know, I actually did go back and search the laws to see if there was a definition. What is town council? And I could not find one. I found a million references in the, in the mass general laws to town council, but not one that said, this is what town council is, which surprised me. So, so who knows? We'll, we'll find out. So um, is there a way or someone that we can ask um, yes, about... The, no, 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 sorry, not That's about the, the town council, but about how um, the agenda can get corrected. I will just add, I brought it up at the meeting and and town council slash like board council did not see an issue with the way that it was raised as, as I, I asked them about that. And the select board clearly, because they have it on, had it on their, their agenda, did not see an issue with it. So I'm not sure that we would be able to get it changed. I, I, yeah. unless, you know, we, we I don't think we sort. can change it. I mean, wouldn't it well, sort of, I I mean, it sort of right. defeats the purpose of having an open, if you have an open meeting law violation for not having something on your agenda, you could just go back and retroactively change your agenda and fix it. We, we well, could ask for an addendum. Well, well the issue here is not removing the item. It's, it's correct. correcting right. the phrasing. It's fixing, right. it's fixing the phrasing, correct. So, and, 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 you know, there could be, I would never want to do this. This is a waste of resources. But I mean, hypothetically, if we were to, you know, if you go to the newspaper and the newspaper publishes a story that is defamatory or knowingly, you know, false and they do it with intent, right, then yes, you can sue them. And again, I'm not, just to be clear to anybody who's listening, I'm not suggesting anybody suing anybody, but I'm saying that you, you, your, your course of action from a legal perspective would be to sue them and demand a correction, right? They don't, they don't necessarily go back and fix the, the, the newspaper that, that they publish the in, inaccurate information is they publish a, a correction that makes it clear to everybody that, that what they publish is wrong. So well, that would be, that would be know, fine. That's up to them. But I'm just saying that, 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 you know, I, I have no idea whether you can do that with an agenda or where they can have it at an agenda item where they put in their agenda, you know, an item to, to note for the record that the, the agenda item from the prior week was, was inaccurate or something like that. But again, I, I, would, I don't that, like it. I don't like having it in the historical record because there was no violation. Mm -hmm. But I also know that from the AG's point of view, anybody that went and looked for that would never find a violation because none occurred. So, so that's why I said it's it's an annoyance, but it's there. So, so it's it's not something we have much bigger fish to fry at this point. So, so uh, okay. So that's an upset on that. I mean, we did. The good thing is we we spent a little time on it, but it wasn't time about the, the meeting per se, it was the ramifications of the meeting, which is a better, better topic to discuss. So, okay, so that's the end of the agenda. And we've 
reached a nice two and a half hour mark here. So, um, so does anybody have anything else they want to bring up administratively, right? Because we have no other agenda topics. So if there's any other, uh, you know, administrative business who should have been covered under item one, then hearing none, I will entertain the motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, that's not subject to debate. Well, we should say what time it is, right? Oh, that's right. For the record, will when he, nine, um, when, yes, 9.38 p.m. Okay, roll call vote, Michelle. Aye. Ben? Aye. Ben, ben or Ben? I said, I said, no, I said, Ben, you got it, Ben. Dan? Okay. Aye. Sue? Aye. Tim? Aye. Ben? Aye. Okay, and I vote aye, and I know I was informal, but I figured after two and a half hours, I don't have to go through the whole formality here. So, so the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for joining us. For those of you joining us on HCAT or via Zoom, you can feel free to leave. But for tonight, we are done. Thank you, and good night. Have a good night, everyone. Yeah, you guys too.